Section number 30 of Jurisprudence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Overby, Parkland, Washington. Jurisprudence by John Salmond. Chapter 20. The Law of Property. Part 1. Section 152. Meanings of the term property. The substantive civil law is divisible into three great departments, namely the law of property, the law of obligations, and the law of status. The first deals in proprietary rights, in rem, the second with proprietary rights, in personum, and the third with personal and non-proprietary rights, whether in rem or in persona. In this chapter we will consider the outline of the first of these branches, and we shall then proceed to deal in the same manner with the law of obligations. The law of status, on the other hand, is not of such a nature as to require or repay any further consideration from the point of view of general theory. The term property, which we here use as meaning proprietary rights in REM, possesses a singular variety of different applications having different degrees of generality. These are the following. 1. All legal rights. In its widest sense, property includes all a person's legal rights, of whatever description. A man's property is all that is his in law. This usage, however, is obsolete at the present day, though it is common enough in the older books. Thus Blackstone speaks of the property, i.e. right, which a master has in the person of his servant, and a father in the person of his child. The inferior, he says, hath no kind of property in the company, care, or assistance, as the superior is held to have in those of the inferior. So Hobbes says, of things held in property, those that are dearest to a man are his own life and limbs, and in the next degree, in most men, those that concern conjugal affection, and after them, riches and means of living. In like manner, Locke tells us that every man has a property in his own person, and he speaks elsewhere of a man's right to preserve his property, that is, his life, liberty, and estate. 2. Proprietary rights, dominimum and status. In a second and narrower sense, property includes not all a person's rights, but only his proprietary, as opposed to his personal rights. The former constitute his estate, or property, while the latter constitute his status, or personal condition. In this sense, a man's land, chattels, and shares, and the debts due to him, are his property, but not his life, or liberty, or reputation. In this sense, we may oppose to Locke's statement that a man has a property in his own person, the saying of Ulpian, Dominus membrorum suorum nemo viditur. This is probably the most frequent application of the term at the present day, but in the case of a word having so many recognized varieties of usage, it is idle to attempt to single out any one of them as exclusively correct. They are all of equal authenticity. 3. Property rights in rem, dominium and obligatio. In a third application, which is that adopted in this chapter, the term includes not even all proprietary rights, but only those that are both proprietary and real. The law of property is the law of proprietary rights in rem the law of proprietary rights in personum being distinguished from it as the law of obligations. According to this usage, a freehold or leasehold estate in land, or a patent or copyright, is property, but a debt, or the benefit of a contract, is not. 4. Corporeal property, dominium corporis and dominium iuris. Finally, in the narrowest use of the term, it includes nothing more than corporeal property, that is to say, the right of ownership in a material object, or that object itself identified with the right by way of metonymy. Thus, property is defined by Ahrens as a material object subject to the immediate power of a person, and Bentham considers as metaphorical and improper the extension of the term to include other rights than those which relate to material things. Section 153. Kinds of Property. All property is, as we have already seen, either corporeal or incorporeal. Corporeal property is the right of ownership in material things, Incorporeal property is any other proprietary right in rem. Incorporeal property is itself of two kinds, namely, jura en re aliena, or encumbrances, whether over material or immaterial things, for example, leases, mortgages, and servitudes, and, two, jura en re propria, over immaterial things, for example, patents, copyrights, and trademarks. The resulting threefold division of property appears in the following table. The table will be read beginning at the root, property. Underneath the root, property, there are jura en re propria and jura en re aliena. 
Underneath Yura and Re Propria, there are material things and immaterial things. Underneath material things, there are lands and chattels. These material things are termed corporeal property. The remainder of the tree is termed incorporeal property. The sibling of material things is immaterial things. Underneath immaterial things, there are patents, copyrights, trademarks, etc. The sibling of Yura Enra Propria is Yura Enra Aliena. Underneath Yura Enra Aliena, there are leases, servitudes, securities, etc. Section 154. The Ownership of Material Things The owner of a material object is he who owns a right to the aggregate of its uses. He who merely has a special and definitively limited right to the use of it, such as a right of way or other servitude, is not an owner of the thing, but merely an encumbrancer of it. The definition, however, must not be misunderstood. Ownership is the right of general use, not that of absolute or unlimited use. He is the owner of a thing who is entitled to all those uses of it, which are not specifically accepted and cut off by the law. No such right as that of absolute and unlimited use is known to the law. All lawful use is either general, that is to say, residuary, or specific, the former being ownership and the latter encumbrance. The limits thus imposed upon an owner's right of use are two kinds. The first constitute the natural limits of ownership. They are the various applications of the maxim, sic utere tuo ut alienum non laidis, a legal principle whose function it is to restrain within due bounds the opposing maxim that a man may do as he pleases with his own. In the interests of the public or of a man's neighbors, many uses of the things which are his are wholly excluded from his right of ownership. The second class of restrictions upon an owner's right of use consists of those which flow from the existence of encumbrances vested in other persons. These are artificial limits which may or may not exist. My land may be mortgaged, leased, charged, bound by restrictive covenants, and so on. Yet I remain the owner of it nonetheless, for I am still entitled to the residue of its uses, and whatever right over it is not specifically vested in someone else is vested in me. The residuary use so left to me may be of very small dimensions. Some encumbrancer may own rights over it much more valuable than mine, but the ownership of it is in me, and not in him. Were his right to determine tomorrow, in any manner, my own, relieved from the encumbrance which now weighs it down, would forthwith spring up to its full stature and have again its full effect. No right loses its identity because of an encumbrance vested in someone else. That which is a right of ownership, when there are no encumbrances, remains a right of ownership notwithstanding any number of them. Inasmuch as the ownership is a right to the aggregate uses of the thing, it follows that ownership is necessarily permanent. No person having merely a temporary right to the use of a thing can be the owner of the thing, however general that right may be while it lasts. He who comes after him is the owner, for it is to him that the residue of the uses of the thing pertains. It is to be understood, however, that by a permanent right is meant nothing more than a right which is capable of lasting as long as the thing itself, which is the subject matter, however long or short that duration may be. Even as the generality of ownership involves its permanence, so its permanence involves the further essential feature of inheritance. The only permanent rights which can be owned by a mortal man are those which can be handed down by him to his successors, or representatives on his death. All others are temporary, their duration being necessarily limited to the lifetime of him in whom they are vested. The right of ownership, therefore, is essentially an inheritable right. It is capable of surviving its owner for the time being. It belongs to the class of rights which are divested by death, but are not extinguished by it. Summing up the conclusions to which we have attained, we may define the right of ownership in a material thing, as the general, permanent, and inheritable right to the uses of the thing. According to the rigor of English legal doctrine, there can be no owner in land except the crown itself. The fee simple of land, the greatest right in it, which the subject can possess, is not in truth ownership, but a mere encumbrance upon the ownership of the crown. It is a tenancy or lease granted to a man and his heirs. It is a temporary, not a permanent right, of user. It will come to its natural termination on the death of the tenant, without leaving an heir or device C, in whom the right may be continued. The land will thereupon revert, or a cheat, to the crown. That is to say, the crown's ownership, which has never been divested, but has merely been encumbranced by the fee simple, will, through the destruction of this encumbrance, become once more free and absolute. In the case of chattels, it is otherwise. They can be owned by the subject no less than by the crown. It is true that if the owner of them dies intestate without kin, 
they will go to the crown as bona vacantia, just as land will go to the crown as an escheat. But between these two processes, there is a profound difference in legal theory. In the case of chattels, the crown succeeds to the right which was vested in the dead man. His ownership is continued in the crown, just as it would have been continued in his next of kin, had there been any. But in the case of escheat, as already said, the right of the dead man has come to an end, and the crown succeeds to no right of his, but simply comes into its own again. This distinction, however, between the fee simple of land and the ownership of it, is a matter of form rather than of substance. In fact, if not in legal theory, the right of a tenant in fee simple is permanent, for a cheat takes place only on an intestacy, and therefore can be prevented by the act of the tenant. We are at liberty, therefore, to disregard this technicality of real property law, and to speak of the fee simple of land as the ownership of it, the right of the crown being viewed, accordingly, not as vested in continuing ownership subject to an encumbrance, but as a contingent right of succession to an intestate owner. Section 155. Movable and Immovable Property. Among material things, the most important distinction is that between movables and immovables, or, to use terms more familiar in English law, between chattels and land. In all legal systems, these two classes of object are to some extent governed by different rules, though in no system is the difference so great as in our own. Considered in its legal aspect, an immovable, that is to say, a piece of land, includes the following elements. 1. A determinate portion of the Earth's surface. 2. The ground beneath the surface down to the center of the world. All the pieces of land in England meet together in one terminal point at the Earth's center. 3. Possibly the column of space above the surface ad infinitum. The Earth, says Coke, hath in law a great extent upwards, not only of water, as hath been said, but of air, and all other things even up to heaven. For suius est solum, eius est usque ad silum. The authenticity of this doctrine, however, is not wholly beyond dispute. It would prohibit, as an actionable trespass, all use of the airspace above the appropriated surface of the earth, at whatever height this use took place, and however little it could affect the interests of the landowner. If a man is carried in a balloon at a distance of half a mile above the ground, does he infringe the rights of those who own the surface? It may be that the law recognizes no right of ownership in the airspace at all, or at least no right of exclusive use, but merely prohibits all acts which, by their nature or their proximity, interfere with the full enjoyment and use of the surface. By the German Civil Code, the owner of land owns the space above it, but has no right to prohibit acts so remote from the surface that they in no way affect his interests. 4. All objects which are on or under the surface in its natural state, for example, minerals and natural vegetation. All these are part of the land, even though they are in no way physically attached to it. Stones lying loose upon the surface are in the same category as the stone in the quarry. 5. Lastly, all objects placed by human agency on or under the surface, with the intention of permanent annexation, these become part of the land and lose their identity as separate movables or chattels. For example, buildings, walls, and fences. Omne quad inidificator solo sedit, said the Roman law. Provided that the requisite intent of permanent annexation is present, no physical attachment to the surface is required. A wall built of stones without mortar or foundations is part of the land on which it stands. Conversely, physical attachment, without the intent of permanent annexation, is not in itself enough. Carpets, tapestries, or ornaments nailed to the floors or walls of a house are not thereby made part of the house. Money buried in the ground is as much a chattel as money in the owner's pocket. It is clear that the distinction between movables and immovables is in truth and in fact applicable to material objects only, yet the law has made an unfortunate attempt to apply this to rights also. Rights, no less than things, are conceived by the law as having a local situation and as being either movable or permanently fixed in a definite locality. The origin of this illogical conception is to be found in the identification of rights of ownership with the material things which are the objects of them. I am said to own land and chattels, as well as easements, shares, debts, contracts, and patents. All these things are equally property, and since some of them have a local situation and can be truly classed as movable or immovable, the law has been led by inadvertence to attribute these qualities to all of them. It is recognized in things which are incorporeal certain attributes which in truth pertain to things corporeal only, 
It has divided the whole sphere of proprietary rights by reference to a distinction which is truly applicable not to rights at all, but to physical objects. Nor is this merely a peculiarity of English law, for it is found in continental systems also. On what principle, then, does the law determine whether a right is to be classed as immovable or as movable? The general rule is that a right has, in this respect, the same quality as its subject matter. Every right over an immovable thing, whether it is a right of ownership, or a lease, or a servitude, or a security, or any other un re aliena, is itself immovable, and every other right over a movable thing is itself movable. So far, there is no difficulty. What shall we say, however, of those rights which have no material objects at all, such as a copyright, a patent, the goodwill of a business, a trademark, or the benefit of a contract? The answer is that all such rights are classed by the law as movable, for the class of movable property is residuary, and includes all rights which can make no good claim to be classed as immovable. The law not merely classifies rights as movable and immovable, but goes further in the same direction and attributes local situation to them. It undertakes to say not merely whether a right exists, but where it exists. Nor is this a difficult task in the case of those rights which have determinate material things as their objects. A servitude or other un re aliena over a piece of land is situated in law where the land is situated in fact. A right over a chattel is movable property, and where the chattel goes, the right goes also. But where there is no material object at all, what are we to say as to the local situation of the right? Where is the debt situated, or a share in a company, or the benefit of a contract, or a copyright? Such questions can be determined only by more or less arbitrary rules, based upon analogy, and it is to be regretted that it has been thought needful to ask and answer them at all. As the law stands, however, it contains several rules based on the assumption that all property which exists must exist somewhere, and for the application of these rules the determination of the local situation of rights is necessary, even though it leads into the region of legal fictions. The legal conception of property, says Lord Lindley, appears to me to involve the legal conception of existence somewhere. To talk of property as existing nowhere is to use language which to me is unintelligible. The leading principle as to the local situation of rights is that they are situated where they are exercised and enjoyed. Rights over material things, therefore, have the same situation as those things themselves. The goodwill of a business is situated in the place where the business is carried on. Debts are in general situated in the place where the debtor resides, since it is there that the creditor must go to get his money. Section 156. Real and Personal Property Derived from and closely connected with the distinction between immovable and movable property is that between real and personal property. These are two cross divisions of the whole sphere of proprietary rights. Real property and immovable property form intersecting circles which are very nearly, though not quite, coincident. The law of real property is almost equivalent to the law of land, while the law of personal property is all but identical with the law of movables. The partial failure of coincidence is due not to any logical distinction, but to the accidental course of legal development, and to this extent the distinction between real and personal property is purely arbitrary and possesses no scientific basis. Real property comprises all rights over land, with such additions and exceptions as the law has seen fit to establish. All other proprietary rights, whether in rem or in personam, pertain to the law of personal property. The distinction between real and personal property has no logical connection with that between real and personal rights. There is, however, an historical relation between them, inasmuch as they are both derived from the same source, namely the Roman distinction between actions in rem and actions in personam. Real property meant originally that which was recoverable in a real action, while personal property was that which was recoverable in a personal action. And this distinction between real and personal actions was derived by Bracton and other founders of our law from the Actionis in rem and in personam of Justinian, though not without important modifications of the Roman doctrine. In connection with the distinctions between movable and immovable, and between real and personal property, we must notice the legal significance of the term chattel. This word has apparently three different meanings in English law. 1. A movable physical object, for example, a horse, a book, or a shilling, as contrasted with a piece of land. 2. Movable property, whether corporeal or incorporeal, that is to say, chattels in the first sense, together with all proprietary rights, except those which are classed as immovable. In this usage, debts, shares, contracts, and other choses in action are chattel, no less than furniture or stock in trade, 
so also are patents and copyrights, and other rights in rem, which are not rights over land. This double use of the word chattel, to indicate both material things and rights, is simply an application, within the sphere of movable property, of the metonymy which is the source of the distinction between corporeal and incorporeal property. 3. Personal property, whether movable or immovable, as opposed to real property. In this sense, leaseholds are classed as chattels because of the special rule by which they are excluded from the domain of real property. Section 157. Rights in re propria, in immaterial things. The subject matter of a right of property is either a material or an immaterial thing. A material thing is a physical object. An immaterial thing is anything else which may be the subject matter of a right. It is to things of the former class that the law of property almost wholly relates. In the great majority of cases, a right of property is a right to the uses of a material object. It is the chief purpose of this department of the law to allot to every man his portion in the material instruments of human well-being. To divide the earth and the fullness of it among the men who live in it, the only immaterial things which are recognized by the law as the subject matter of rights of this description are the various immaterial products of human skill and labor. Speaking generally, we may say that in modern law every man owns that which he creates. That which he produces is his, and he has an exclusive right to the use of and benefit of it. The immaterial product of a man's brains may be as valuable as his land or his goods. The law, therefore, gives him a proprietary right in it, and the unauthorized use of it by other persons is a violation of his ownership, no less than theft or trespass is. These immaterial forms of property are of five chief kinds. 1. Patents. The subject matter of a patent right is an invention. He whose skill or labor produces the idea of a new process, instrument, or manufacture has that idea as his own in law. He alone is entitled to use it and to draw from it the profit inherent in it. 2. Literary copyright. The subject matter of this right is the literary expression of facts or thoughts. He to whose skill or labor this expression is due has in it a proprietary right of exclusive use. 3. Artistic copyright. Artistic design in all its various forms, such as drawing, painting, sculpture, and photography, is the subject matter of a right of exclusive use analogous to literary copyright. The creations of an artist's skill or of a photographer's labor are his exclusive property. The object of this right is not the material thing produced, but the form impressed upon it by the maker. The picture, in the concrete sense of the material paint and canvas, belongs to him who purchases it, but the picture, in the abstract sense of the artistic form, made visible by that paint and canvas, belongs to him who made it. The former is material property, the latter is immaterial. The right, in each case, is one of exclusive use. The right to the material picture is infringed by destroying it or taking it away. The right to the immaterial picture is infringed by making material pictures which embody it. 4. Musical and Dramatic Copyright A fourth class of immaterial things consists of musical and dramatic works. The immaterial product of the skill of the musician, or the playwright, is the subject matter of a proprietary right of exclusive use, which is infringed by any unauthorized performance or representation. 5. Commercial Goodwill, Trademarks and Trade Names The fifth and last species of immaterial things includes commercial goodwill and the special forms of it known as trademarks and trade names. He who by his skill and labor establishes a business acquires an interest in the goodwill of it, that is to say, in the established disposition of customers to resort to him. To this goodwill he has an exclusive right, which is violated by anyone who seeks to make use of it for his own advantage, as by falsely representing to the public that he is himself carrying on the business in question. Special forms of this right of commercial goodwill are rights to trade names and trademarks. Every man has an exclusive right to the name under which he carries on business or sells goods. To this extent, at least, that no one is at liberty to use that name for the purpose of deceiving the public, and so injuring the owner of it. He has a similar right to the exclusive use of the marks which he impresses upon his goods, and by which they are known and identified in the market as his. Section 158. Leases. Having now considered the different kinds of rights in re propria, which fall within the law of property, we proceed to deal with the various rights in re aliena, to which they may be subject. As already stated, the chief of these are four in number, namely leases, servitudes, securities, and trusts. The nature of a trust has been sufficiently examined in another connection, and it is necessary here to consider the other three only, and first of leases or tenancies. 
Although a lease of land and a bailment of chattels are transactions of essentially the same nature, there is no term which, in its recognized use, is sufficiently wide to include both. The term bailment is never applied to the tenancy of land, and although the term lease is not wholly inapplicable to the case of chattels, its use in this connection is subject to arbitrary limitations. It is necessary, therefore, in the interests of orderly classification, to do some violence to received usage, in adopting the term lease as a generic expression to include not merely the tenancy of land, but all kinds of bailments of chattel, and all encumbrances of incorporeal property, which possess the same essential nature as a tenancy of land. A lease, in this generic sense, is that form of encumbrance which consists in a right to the possession and use of property owned by some other person. It is the outcome of the rightful separation of ownership and possession. We have seen that possession is the continuing exercise of a right, and that although a right is normally exercised by the owner of it, it may, in special cases, be exercised by someone else. This separation of ownership and possession may be either rightful or wrongful, and if rightful, it is an encumbrance of the owner's title. The right which is thus encumbered by a lease is usually the ownership of a material object, and more particularly the ownership of land. Here, as elsewhere, the material object is identified in speech with the right itself. We say that the land is leased, just as we say that the land is owned or possessed. The lessee of land is he who rightfully possesses it, but does not own it. The lesser of land is he who owns it, but who has transferred the possession of it to another. Encumbrance, by way of lease, is not confined, however, to the right of ownership of a material object. All rights may be leased which can be possessed, that is to say, which admit of continuing exercise, and no rights can be leased which cannot be possessed, that is to say, which are extinguished by their exercise. A servitude appurtenant to land, such as a right of way, is leased along with the land itself. The owner of a lease may encumber it with a sublease. The owner of a patent or copyright may grant a lease of it for a term of years, entitling the lessee to the exercise and use of the right, but not to the ownership of it. Even obligations may be encumbered in the same fashion, provided that they admit of continuing or repeated exercise. For example, annuities, shares, money in the public funds, or interest-bearing debts. All these may be rightfully possessed without being owned, and owned without being possessed, as when they are settled in trust for a tenant for life with remainder to someone else. Is it essential that a lease should be of less duration than the right which is subject to it? This is almost invariably the case. Land is leased for a term of years or for life, but not in perpetuity. The owner of a thing owns it forever, but the lessee of it possesses it for a time. We may be tempted, therefore, to regard this difference of duration as essential, and to define a lease as a right to the temporary exercise of a right vested in someone else, but this is not so. There is no objection in principle to a lease of land in perpetuity, or to a lease of a patent or copyright for the full term of its existence. It may be objected that a lease of this description would not be a true lease or encumbrance at all, but an assignment of the right itself, that the grantee would become the owner of the right, and not a mere encumbrancer. And in favor of this contention it may be pointed out that a sublease for the whole term is construed in English law as an assignment of the term, a sublease being necessarily shorter than the term, if only by a single day. Whatever the actual rule of English law may be, however, there is nothing in legal theory to justify us in asserting that any difference of duration is essential to the existence of a true lease. A lease exists whenever the rightful possession of a thing is separated from the ownership of it, and although the separation is usually temporary, there is no difficulty in supposing it permanent. I may own a permanent right to exercise another right without owning the latter right itself. The ownership may remain dormant, deprived of any right of exercise and enjoyment, in the hands of the lesser. I am not necessarily the owner of a patent because I have acquired by contract with the owner a right to the exclusive use of it during the whole term of its duration. So far as legal principle is concerned, I may still remain the owner of a lease, although I may have granted a sublease to another for the whole residue of the term. To assign a lease and to sublet it for the whole term are the intention of the parties and, in legal theory, two entirely different transactions. The assignment is a substitution of one tenant for another, the assignor retaining no rights whatsoever. The sublease, on the contrary, is designed to leave the original relation of landlord and tenant untouched, the sublessee being the tenant of the lessee and not of the original lesser. Section 159. Servitudes. A servitude is that form of encumbrance which consists in a right to the limited use of a piece of land without the possession of it. For example, a right of way over it, a right to the passage of light across it to the windows of a house on the adjoining land, a right to depasture cattle upon it or a right to derive support from it for the foundations of an adjoining building. 
It is an essential characteristic of a servitude that it does not involve the possession of the land over which it exists. This is the difference between a servitude and a lease. A lease of land is the rightful possession and use without the ownership of it, while a servitude over land is the rightful use without either the ownership or the possession of it. There are two distinct methods in which I may acquire a road across another man's property. I may agree with him for the exclusive possession of a defined strip of the land, or I may agree with him for the use of such a strip for the sole purpose of passage, without any exclusive possession or occupation of it. In the first case, I acquire a lease. In the second, a servitude. Servitudes are of two kinds, which may be distinguished as private and public. A private servitude is one vested in a determinate individual, for example, the right of way, of light, or of support, vested in the owner of one piece of land over an adjoining piece, or a right granted to one person of fishing in the water of another, or of mining in another's land. A public servitude is one vested in the public at large, or in some class of indeterminate individuals. For example, the right of the public to a highway over land in private ownership, and the right of the public to navigate a river, of which the bed belongs to some private person the right of inhabitants of a parish to use a certain piece of private ground for the purposes of recreation. Servitudes are further distinguishable in the language of English law as being either apparent or in gross. A servitude appurtenant is one which is not merely an encumbrance of one piece of land, but is also accessory to another piece. It is the right of using one piece for the benefit of another, as in the case of a right of way from A's house to the high road across B's house, or a right of support for the building, or a right to the access of light to a window. The land which is burdened with such a servitude is called the servient land or tenement. That which has the benefit of it is called the dominant land or tenement. The servitude runs with each of these tenements into the lands of successive owners and occupiers. Both the benefit and the burden of it are concurrent with the ownership of the lands concerned. A servitude is said to be in gross, on the other hand, when it is not so attached an accessory to any dominant tenement for whose benefit it exists. An example is a public right of way or of navigation, or of recreation, or a private right of fishing, pasturage, or mining. End of section 30. Section 31 of Jurisprudence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Jurisprudence by John Salmond. Chapter 20, The Law of Property, Part 2. Section 160. Securities. A security is an encumbrance, the purpose of which is to ensure or facilitate the fulfillment or enjoyment of some other right, usually, though not necessarily, a debt, vested in the same person. Such securities are of two kinds, which may be distinguished as mortgages and liens, if we use the latter term in its widest permissible sense. In considering the nature of this distinction, we must first notice a plausible but erroneous explanation. A mortgage, it is sometimes said, is a security created by the transfer of the debtor's property to the creditor, while a lien is merely an encumbrance of some sort created in favor of the creditor over property which remains vested in the debtor. A mortgagee is the owner of the property, while a pledgee or other liene is merely an encumbrancer of it. This, however, is not a strictly accurate account of the matter, though it is true in the great majority of cases. A mortgage may be created by way of encumbrance, no less than by way of transfer, and a mortgagee does not necessarily become the owner of the property mortgaged. A lease, for example, is commonly mortgaged, not by the assignment of it, but by the grant of a sublease to the creditor, so that the mortgagee becomes not the owner of a lease, but an encumbrancer of it. Similarly, freehold land may be mortgaged by the grant to the mortgagee of a long term of years. Inasmuch, therefore, as a mortgage is not necessarily the transfer of the property to the creditor, what is its essential characteristic? The question is one of considerable difficulty, but the true solution is apparently this. A lien is a right which is in its own nature a security for a debt and nothing more. For example, a right to retain possession of a chattel until payment, a right to distrain for rent, or a right to receive payment out of a certain fund. A mortgage, on the contrary, is a right which is in its own nature an independent or principal right, and not a mere security for another right, 
but which is artificially cut down and limited so that it may serve in the particular case as a security and nothing more. For example, the fee simple of land, a lease of land for a term of years, or the ownership of a chattel. The right of the leanee is vested in him absolutely, and not merely by way of security, for it is itself nothing more than a security. The right of a mortgagee, on the contrary, is vested in him conditionally, and by way of security only, for it is, in itself, something more than a mere security. A lien cannot survive the debt secured. It ceases and determines ipso jure on the execution of the debt. It is merely the shadow, so to speak, cast by the debt upon the property of the debtor. But the right vested in a mortgagee has an independent existence. It will, or may, remain outstanding in the mortgagee even after the extinction of the debt. When thus left outstanding, it must be retransferred or surrendered to the mortgagor, and the right of the mortgagor to this reassignment or surrender is called his right or equity of redemption. The existence of such an equity of redemption is therefore the test of a mortgage. In liens there is no such right, for there is nothing to redeem. The creditor owns no right which he can be bound to give back or surrender to his debtor. For his right of security has come to its natural and necessary termination, with the termination of the right secured. Mortgages are created either by the transfer of the debtor's right to the creditor, or by the encumbrance of it in his favor. The first of these methods is by far the more usual and important. Moreover, it is peculiar to mortgages, for liens can be created only by way of encumbrance. Whenever a debtor transfers his right to the creditor by way of security, the result is necessarily a mortgage, for there can be no connection between the duration of the debt so secured and the natural duration of the right so transferred. The right transferred may survive the debt, and the debtor therefore retains the right of redemption, which is the infallible test of a mortgage. When, on the other hand, a debtor encumbers his right in favor of the creditor, the security so created is either a mortgage or a lien according to circumstances. It is a mortgage if the encumbrance so created is independent of the debt secured in respect of its natural duration. For example, a term of years or permanent servitude. It is a lien if the encumbrance is in respect of its natural duration dependent on and coincident with the debt secured. For example, a pledge, a vendor's lien, a landlord's right of distress, or an equitable charge on a fund. Speaking generally, any alienable and valuable right whatever may be the subject matter of a mortgage. Whatever can be transferred can be transferred by way of mortgage. Whatever can be encumbered can be encumbered by way of mortgage. Whether I own land or chattels or debts or shares or patents or copyrights or leases or servitudes or equitable interests in trust funds or the benefit of a contract, I may so deal with them as to constitute a valid mortgage security. Even a mortgage itself may be transferred by the mortgagee to some creditor of his own by way of mortgage, such a mortgage of a mortgage being known as a sub-mortgage. In a mortgage by way of transfer, the debtor, though he assigns the property to his creditor, remains nonetheless the beneficial or equitable owner of it himself. A mortgagor, by virtue of his equity of redemption, has more than a mere personal right against the mortgagee to the reconveyance of the property. He is already the beneficial owner of it. This double ownership of mortgaged property is merely a special form of trust. The mortgagee holds in trust for the mortgagor and has himself no beneficial interest, save so far as is required for the purpose of an effective security. On the payment or extinction of the debt, the mortgagee becomes a mere trustee and nothing more. The ownership remains vested in him, but is now bare of any vestige of beneficial interest. A mortgage, therefore, has a double aspect and nature. Viewed in respect of the nudum dominium vested in the mortgagee, it is a transfer of the property. Viewed in respect of the beneficial ownership which remains vested in the mortgagor, it is merely an encumbrance of it. The prominence of mortgage as the most important form of security is a peculiarity of English law. In Roman law, and in the modern continental system based upon it, the place assumed by mortgages in our system is taken by the lien, hypotheca, in its various forms. The Roman mortgage, fiducia, fell wholly out of use before the time of Justinian, having been displaced by the superior simplicity and convenience of the hypotheca. And in this respect, modern continental law has followed the Roman. There can be no doubt that a similar substitution of the lien for the mortgage 
would immensely simplify and improve the law of England. The complexity and difficulty of the English law of security, due entirely to the adoption of the system of mortgages, must be a source of amazement to a French and German lawyer. Whatever can be done by way of mortgage in securing debt can be done equally well by way of lien, and the lien avoids all that extraordinary disturbance and complication of legal relations which is essentially involved in the mortgage. The best type of security is that which combines the most efficient protection of the creditor with the least interference with the rights of the debtor, and in this latter respect the mortgage falls far short of the ideal. The true form of security is a lien, leaving the full legal and equitable ownership in the debtor, but vesting in the creditor such rights and powers, as of sale, possession, and so forth, as are required, according to the nature of the subject matter, to give the creditor sufficient protection and lapsing ipso jure with the discharge of the debt secured. Liens are of various kinds, none of which present any difficulty or require any special consideration. 1. Possessory liens, consisting in the right to retain possession of chattels or other property of the debtor. A power of sale may or may not be combined with this right of possession. Examples are pledges of chattels and the liens of innkeepers, solicitors, and vendors of goods. 2. Rights of distress or seizure, consisting in the right to take possession of the property of the debtor, with or without a power of sale. Examples are the right of distress for rent, and the right of the occupier of land to distrain cattle trespassing on it. 3. Powers of sale. This is a form of security seldom found in isolation, for it is usually incidental to the right of possession conferred by one or other of the two preceding forms of lien. There is no reason, however, why it should not in itself form an effective security. 4. Powers of forfeiture consisting in a power vested in the creditor of destroying in his own interest some adverse right vested in the debtor. Examples are a landlord's right of re-entry upon his tenant and a vendor's right of forfeiting the deposit paid by the purchaser. 5. Charges. Consisting of the right of a creditor to receive payment out of some specific fund or out of the proceeds of the realization of specific property. The fund or property is said to be charged with the debt, which is thus payable out of it. Section 161. Modes of Acquisition. Possession. Having considered the various forms which proprietary rights in REM assume, we proceed to examine the modes of their acquisition. An attempt to give a complete list of these titles would here serve no useful purpose, and we shall confine our attention to four of them which are of primary importance. These are the following. Possession, Prescription, Agreement, and Inheritance. The possession of a material object is a title to the ownership of it. The de facto relation between the person and the thing becomes the de jure relation along with it. He who claims a chattel or a piece of land as his and makes good his claim in fact by way of possession makes it good in law also by way of ownership. There is, however, an important distinction to be drawn. For the thing so possessed may, or may not, already belong to some other person. If, when possession of it is taken by the claimant, it is as yet the property of no one, res nilius, as the Romans said, the possessor acquires a good title against the world. The fish of the sea and the fowls of the air belong by an absolute title to him who first succeeds in obtaining possession of them. This mode of acquisition is known in Roman law as occupatio. On the other hand, the thing of which possession is taken may already be the property of someone else. In this case, the title acquired by possession is good, indeed, against all third persons, but is of no validity at all against the true owner. Possession, even when consciously wrongful, is allowed as a title of right against all persons who cannot show a better, because a prior, title in themselves. Save with respect to the rights of the original proprietor, my rights to the watch in my pocket are much the same, whether I bought it honestly, or found it, or abstracted it from the pocket of someone else. If it is stolen from me, the law will help me to the recovery of it. I can effectually sell it, lend it, give it away, or bequeath it, and it will go on my death in test state to my next of kin. Whoever acquires it from me, however, acquires in general nothing save my limited and imperfect title to it, and holds it, as I do, subject to the superior claims of the original owner. A thing owned by one man and thus adversely possessed by another has, in truth, two owners. The ownership of the one is absolute and perfect, while that of the other is relative and imperfect, and is often called, by reason of its origin and possession, possessory ownership. 
if a possessory owner is wrongfully deprived of the thing by a person other than the true owner he can recover it for the defendant cannot set up as a defense his own possessory title since it is later than and consequently inferior to the possessory title of the plaintiff nor can he set up as a defense the title of the true owner the jez tertiae as it is called the plaintiff has a better because an earlier title than the defendant and it is irrelevant that the title of some other person not a party to the suit is better still the expediency of this doctrine of possessory ownership is clear were it not for such a rule force and fraud would be left to determine all disputes as to possession between persons of whom neither could show an unimpeachable title to the thing as the true owner of it section 162 prescription prescription may be defined as the effect of lapse of time in creating and destroying rights it is the operation of time as a vestitive fact it is of two kinds namely one positive or acquisitive prescription and two negative or extinctive prescription the former is the creation of a right the latter is the destruction of one by the lapse of time an example of the former is the acquisition of a right of way by the de facto use of it for twenty years an instance of the latter is the destruction of the right to sue for a debt after six years from the time at which it first became payable lapse of time therefore has two opposite effects in positive prescription it is a title of right but in negative prescription it is a divestitive fact whether it shall operate in the one way or the other depends on whether it is or is not accompanied by possession Positive prescription is the investitive operation of lapse of time with possession, while negative prescription is the divestitive operation of lapse of time without possession. Long possession creates rights, and long want of possession destroys them. If I possess an easement for 20 years without owning it, I begin at the end of that period to own as well as to possess it. Conversely, if I own land for 12 years without possessing it, I cease on the termination of that period either to own or to possess it. In both forms of prescription, fact and right, possession and ownership, tend to coincidence. Ex facto orator just. If the root of fact is destroyed, the right growing out of it withers and dies in course of time. If the fact is present, the right will, in the fullness of time, proceed from it. In many cases, the two forms of prescription coincide. The property which one person loses through long dispossession is often at the same time acquired by someone else through long possession, Yet, this is not always so, and it is necessary in many instances to know whether legal effect is given to long possession, in which case the prescription is positive, or too long want of possession, in which case the prescription is negative. I may, for example, be continuously out of possession of my land for twelve years, without any other single person having continuously held possession of it for that length of time. It may have been in the hands of a series of trespassers against me and against each other, in this case, if the legally recognized form of prescription is positive, it is inoperative, and I retain my ownership. But if the law recognizes negative prescription instead of positive, as in this case our own system does, my title will be extinguished. Who in such circumstances will acquire the right which I thus lose depends not on the law of prescription, but on the rules as to the acquisition of things which have no owner. The doctrine that prior possession is a good title against all but the true owner will confer on the first of a series of adverse possessors a good title against all the world so soon as the title of the true owner has been extinguished by negative prescription. The rational basis of prescription is to be found in the presumption of the coincidence of possession and ownership, of fact and of right. Owners are usually possessors, and possessors are usually owners. Fact and right are normally coincident, therefore the former is evidence of the latter. That a thing is possessed de facto is evidence that it is owned de jure. That it is not possessed raises a presumption that it is not owned either. Want of possession is evidence of want of title. The longer the possession or want of possession has continued, the greater is its evidential value. That I have occupied land for a day raises a very slight presumption that I am the owner of it. But if I continue to occupy it for twenty years, the presumption becomes indefinitely stronger. If I have a claim of debt against a man, unfulfilled and unenforced, the lapse of six months may have but little weight as evidence that my claim is unfounded, or that it has already been satisfied, but the lapse of ten years may amount to ample proof of this. If, therefore, I am in possession of anything in which I claim a right, 
I have evidence of my right which differs from all other evidence, inasmuch as it grows stronger instead of weaker with the lapse of years. The tooth of time may eat away all other proofs of title. Documents are lost, memory fails, witnesses die. But as these become of no avail, an efficient substitute is in the same measure provided by the probative force of long possession. So also with long want of possession as evidence of want of title. As the years pass, the evidence in favor of the title fades, while the presumption against it grows ever stronger. Here, then, we have the chief foundation of the law of prescription. For in this case, as in so many others, the law has deemed it expedient to confer upon certain species of evidence conclusive force. It has established a conclusive presumption in favor of the rightfulness of long possession and against the validity of claims which are vitiated by long want of possession. Lapse of time is recognized as creative and destructive of rights, instead of merely as evidence for and against their existence. In substance, though not always in form, prescription has been advanced from the law of evidence to a place in the substantive law. The conclusive presumption on which prescription is thus founded falls, like all other conclusive presumptions, more or less wide of the truth. Yet in the long run, if used with due safeguards, it is the instrument of justice. It is not true as a matter of fact that a claim unenforced for six years is always unfounded, but it may be wise for the law to act as if it were true. For the effect of thus exaggerating the evidential lapse of time is to prevent the persons concerned from permitting such delays as would render their claims in reality doubtful. In order to avoid the difficulty and error that necessarily result from the lapse of time, the presumption of the coincidence of fact and right is rightly accepted as final after a certain number of years. Whoever wishes to dispute this presumption must do so within that period. Otherwise, his right, if he has one, will be forfeited as a penalty for his neglect. Vigilantibus non dormientibus juris veniant. Prescription is not limited to rights in rem. It is found within the sphere of obligations as well as within that of property. Positive prescription, however, is possible only in the case of rights which admit of possession, that is to say, continuing exercise and enjoyment. Most rights of this nature are rights in rem. Rights in personum are commonly extinguished by their exercise and therefore cannot be possessed or acquired by prescription. And even in that minority of cases in which such rights do admit of possession, and in which positive prescription is therefore theoretically possible, modern law, at least, has seen no occasion for allowing it. This form of prescription, therefore, is peculiar to the law of property. Negative prescription, on the other hand, is common to the law of property and to that of obligations. Most obligations are destroyed by the lapse of time, for since the ownership of them cannot be accompanied by the possession of them, there is nothing to preserve them from the destructive influence of delay in their enforcement. Negative prescription is of two kinds, which may be distinguished as perfect and imperfect. The latter is commonly called the limitation of actions, the former being then distinguished as prescription in a narrow and specific sense. Perfect prescription is the destruction of the principal right itself, while imperfect prescription is merely the destruction of the accessory right of action, the principal right remaining in existence. In other words, in the one case the right is wholly destroyed, but in the other it is merely reduced from a perfect and enforceable right to one which is imperfect and unenforceable. An example of perfect prescription is the destruction of the ownership of land through dispossession for 12 years. The owner of land who has been out of possession for that period does not merely lose his right of action for the recovery of it, but also loses the right of ownership itself. An example of imperfect prescription, on the other hand, is the case of an owner of chattel who has been out of possession of it for six years. He loses his right of action for the recovery of it, but he remains the owner of it nonetheless. His ownership is reduced from a perfect to an imperfect right, but it still subsists. Similarly, a creditor loses in six years his right of action for the debt, but the debt itself is not extinguished and continues to be due and owing. Section 163 agreement. We have already considered the general theory of agreement as a title of right. It will be remembered that we use the term to include not merely contracts, but all other bilateral acts in the law, that is to say, all expressions of the consenting wills of two or more persons directed to an alteration of their legal relations. Agreement in this wide sense is no less important in the law of property than in that of obligations. As a title of proprietary rights in rem, Agreement is of two kinds, namely assignment and grant. 
By the former, existing rights are transferred from one owner to another. By the latter, new rights are created by way of encumbrance upon the existing rights of the grantor. The grant of a lease of land is the creation by agreement between the grantor and grantee of a leasehold vested in the latter and encumbering the freehold vested in the former. The assignment of a lease, on the other hand, is the transfer by agreement of a subsisting leasehold from the assigner to the assignee. Agreement is either formal or informal. We have already sufficiently considered the significance of this formal element in general. There is, however, one formality known to the law of property which requires special notice, namely the delivery of possession. That traditio was an essential element of the voluntary transfer of dominium was a fundamental principle of Roman law. Traditionibus et unscapionibus dominia rerum, non nudis pactus transfer unter. So, in English law, until the year 1845, land could in theory be conveyed in no other method than by the delivery of possession. No deed of conveyance was in itself of any effect. It is true, in practice, this rule was for centuries evaded by taking advantage of that fictitious delivery of possession which was rendered possible by the statute of uses. But it is only by virtue of a modern statute, passed in the year mentioned, that the ownership of land can in legal theory be transferred without possession of it. In the case of chattels, the common law itself succeeded, centuries ago, in cutting down to a very large extent the older principle. Chattels can be assigned by deed without delivery, and also by sale without delivery, but a gift of chattels requires to this day to be completed by the transfer of possession. In this requirement of traditio, we may see a curious remnant of an earlier phase of thought. It is a relic of the times when the law attributed to the fact of possession a degree of importance which at the present day seems altogether disproportionate. Ownership seems to have been deemed little more than an accessory of possession. An owner who had ceased to possess had almost ceased to own, for he was deprived of his most important rights. A person who had not yet succeeded in obtaining possession was not an owner at all, however valid his claim to the possession may have been. The transfer of a thing was conceived as consisting essentially in the transfer of the possession of it. The transfer of rights, apart from the visible transfer of things, had not yet been thought of. So far as the requirement of traditio is still justifiably retained by the law, it is to be regarded as a formality, accessory to the agreement, and serving the same purposes as other formalities. It supplies evidence of the agreement, and it preserves for the parties a locus poenitentiae, lest they be prematurely bound by unconsidered consent. It is a leading principle of law that the title of a grantee or assignee cannot be better than that of his grantor or signer. Nemo plus juris ad alium transferi potest, quam ipsa haberet. No man can transfer or encumber a right which is not his. To this rule, however, there is a considerable number of important exceptions. The rule is ancient, and most of the exceptions are modern and we may anticipate that the future course of legal development will show further derogations from the early principle. There are two conflicting interests in the matter. The older rule is devised for the security of established titles. Under its protection, he who succeeds in obtaining a perfect title may sit down in peace and keep his property against all the world. The exceptions, on the contrary, are established in the interests of those who seek to acquire property, not of those who seek to keep it. The easier it is to acquire a title with safety, the more difficult it is to keep one in safety, and the law must make a compromise between these two adverse interests. The modern tendency is more and more to sacrifice the security of tenure given by the older rule to the facilities for safe and speedy acquisition and disposition given by the exceptions to it. These exceptions are of two kinds. One, those due to the separation of legal from equitable ownership, and two, those due to the separation of ownership from possession. We have seen already that when the legal ownership is in one man and the equitable in another, the legal owner is a trustee for the equitable. He holds the property on behalf of that other, and not for himself, and the obligation of this trusteeship is an encumbrance upon his title. Yet he may, nonetheless, give an unencumbered title to a third person, provided that that person gives value for what he gets, and has at the time no knowledge of the existence of the trust. This rule is known as the equitable doctrine of purchase for value without notice. No man who ignorantly and honestly purchases a defective legal title can be affected by any adverse equitable title vested in anyone else. To this extent, a legal owner can transfer to another more than he has himself, notwithstanding the maxim, nemo dat quad non habit. 
The second class of exceptions to the general principle includes the cases in which the possession of a thing is in one person and the ownership of it in another. Partly by the common law and partly by various modern statutes, the possessor is in certain cases enabled to give a good title to one who deals with him in good faith, believing him to be the owner. The law allows men in these cases to act on the presumption that the possessor of a thing is the owner of it, and he who honestly acts on this presumption will acquire a valid title in all events. The most notable example is the case of negotiable instruments. The possessor of a bank note may have no title to it. He may have found it or stolen it, but he can give a good title to anyone who takes it from him for value and in good faith. Similarly, mercantile agents, in possession of goods belonging to their principals, can effectively transfer the ownership of them, whether they are authorized thereto or not. Section 164. Inheritance. The fourth and last mode of acquisition that we need consider is inheritance. In respect of the death of their owners, all rights are divisible into two classes, being either inheritable or uninheritable. A right is inheritable if it survives its owner, uninheritable if it dies with him. This division is to a large extent, though far from completely, coincident with that between proprietary and personal rights. The latter are in almost all cases so intimately connected with the personality of him in whom they are vested that they are incapable of separate and continued existence. They are not merely divested by death, as are rights of every sort, but are wholly extinguished. In exceptional cases, however, this is not so. Some personal rights are inheritable, just as property is, an instance being the status of hereditary nobility and the political and other privileges accessory thereto. Proprietary rights, on the other hand, are usually inheritable. In respect of them, death is a divestiture, but not an extinctive fact. The exceptions, however, are numerous. A lease may be for the life of the lessee instead of for a fixed term of years. Joint ownership is such that the right of him who dies first is wholly destroyed, the survivor acquiring an exclusive title by the just accrescendi, or right of survivorship. Rights of action for a tort die with the person wronged, except so far as the rule of the common law has been altered by statute. In the great majority of cases, however, death destroys merely the ownership of a proprietary right and not the right itself. The rights which a dead man thus leaves behind him vest in his representative. They pass to some person whom the dead man, or the law on his behalf, has appointed to represent him in the world of the living. This representative bears the person of the deceased, and therefore has vested in him all the inheritable rights, and has imposed upon him all the inheritable liabilities of the deceased. Inheritance is, in some sort, a legal and fictitious continuation of the personality of the dead man, for the representative is, in some sort, identified by the law with him whom he represents. The rights which the dead man can no longer own or exercise in propria persona, and the obligations which he can no longer in propria persona fulfill, he owns, exercises, and fulfills in the person of a living substitute. To this extent, and in this fashion, it may be said that the legal personality of a man survives his natural personality, until, his obligations being duly performed, and his property duly disposed of, his representation among the living is no longer called for. The representative of a dead man, though the property of the deceased is vested in him, is not necessarily the beneficial owner of it. He holds it on behalf of two classes of persons, among whom he himself may or may not be numbered. These are the creditors and the beneficiaries of the estate. Just as many of a man's rights survive him, so also do many of his liabilities, and these inheritable obligations pass to his representative and must be satisfied by him. Being, however, merely the representative of another, he is not liable in propria persona, and his responsibility is limited by the amount of the property which he has acquired from the deceased. He possesses a double personality or capacity, and that which is due from him in right of his executorship cannot be recovered from him in his own right. The beneficiaries who are entitled to the residue after satisfaction of the creditors are of two classes. One, those nominated by the last will of the deceased, and two, those appointed by the law in default of any such nomination. The succession of the former is testamentary, ex testamento. That of the latter is intestate, ab intestato. As to the latter, there is nothing that need be here said, save that the law is chiefly guided by the presumed desires of the dead man, and confers the estate upon his relatives in order of proximity. In default of any known relatives, the property of an intestate is claimed by the state itself, and goes as bona vacantia to the crown. Testamentary succession, on the other hand, demands further consideration. 
although a dead man has no rights a man while yet alive has the right to determine the disposition after he is dead of the property which he leaves behind him his last will duly declared in the document which we significantly call by that name is held inviolable by the law for half a century and more the rights and responsibilities of living men may thus be determined by an instrument which was of no effect until the author of it was in his grave and had no longer any concern with the world or its affairs this power of the dead hand mortua manus is so familiar a feature in the law that we accept it as a matter of course and have some difficulty in realizing what a very singular phenomenon it in reality is it is clear that some limitation must be imposed by the law upon this power of the dead over the living and these restrictions are of three chief kinds one limitations of time it is only during a limited period after his death that the directions of a testator as to the disposition of his property are held valid he must so order the destination of his estate that within this period the whole of it shall become vested absolutely in some one or more persons free from all testamentary conditions and restrictions any attempt to retain the property in manu mortua beyond that time limit makes the testamentary disposition of it void in english law the period is determined by a set of elaborate rules which we need not here consider two limitation of amount a second limitation of testamentary power imposed by most legal systems though not by our own is that a testator can deal with a certain proportion of his estate only the residue being allotted by the law to those to whom he owes a duty of support namely his wife and children three limitations of purpose the power of testamentary dispositions is given to a man that he may use it for the benefit of other men who survive him and to this end only can it be validly exercised the dead hand will not be suffered to withdraw property from the uses of the living no man can validly direct that his land shall lie waste or that his money shall be buried with him or thrown into the sea summary divisions of the substantive civil law one law of property proprietary rights in rem two law of obligations proprietary rights in personam three law of status personal rights meanings of the term property one all legal rights two all proprietary rights three all proprietary rights in rem four rights of ownership in material things divisions of the law of property one ownership of material things corporeal property two rights in re propria in immaterial things e.g. patents and trademarks three rights in re aliena over material or immaterial things e.g. leases trusts and securities the ownership of material things its essential qualities one generality two permanence three inheritance ownership of land in english law movable and immovable property land and chattels movable and immovable rights the local situation of rights real and personal property meaning of the term chattel rights in re propria in immaterial things one patents two literary copyright three artistic copyright four musical and dramatic copyright five goodwill trademarks and trade names encumbrances over property one leases their nature their subject matter their duration two servitudes their nature their kinds public and private appurtenant and in gross three securities their nature mortgages and liens the essential nature of a mortgage equities of redemption mortgages by way of assignment by way of encumbrance the double ownership of mortgaged property the reduction of mortgages to liens the kinds of liens modes of acquiring property one possession absolute title to res nilius absolute ownership relative title to res aliana possessory ownership two prescription positive or acquisitive negative or extinctive rational basis of prescription presumption of coincidence of possession and ownership classes of rights subject to prescription prescription perfect imperfect the limitation of actions three agreement assignment grant formal informal the efficacy of agreement nemo debt quad non habit exceptions separation of legal and equitable ownership separation of ownership and possession four inheritance rights inheritable uninheritable the representatives of dead men 
the creditors of dead men, the beneficiaries of dead men, one, ab intestato, two, ex testamento. The limits of testamentary power. End of section 31. Section 32 of Jurisprudence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Jurisprudence by John Salmond. Chapter 21. The Law of Obligations. Section 165. The Nature of Obligations. Obligation in its popular sense is merely a synonym for duty. Its legal sense, derived from Roman law, differs from this in several respects. In the first place, obligations are merely one class of duties, namely those which are the correlatives of rights in personam. An obligation is the vinculum juris, or bond of legal necessity, which binds together two or more determinate individuals. It includes, for example, the duty to pay a debt, to perform a contract, or to pay damages for a tort, but not the duty to refrain from interference with the person, property, or reputation of others. Secondly, the term obligation is in law the name not merely of the duty, but also of the correlative right. It denotes the legal relation, or vinculum juris, in its entirety, including the right of the one party no less than the liability of the other. Looked at from the point of view of the person entitled, an obligation is a right. Looked at from the point of view of the person bound, it is a duty. We may say either that the creditor acquires, owns, or transfers an obligation, or that the debtor has incurred or been released from one. Thirdly, and lastly, all obligations pertain to the sphere of proprietary rights. They form part of the estate of him who is entitled to them. Rights which relate to a person's status, such as those created by marriage, are not obligations, even though they are rights in personam. An obligation, therefore, may be defined as a proprietary right in personam, or a duty which corresponds to such a right. The person entitled to the benefit of an obligatio was, in Roman law, termed a creditor, while he who was bound by it was called a debitor. We may venture to use the corresponding English terms creditor and debtor in an equally wide sense. We shall speak of every obligation, of whatever nature, as vested in or belonging to a creditor and availing against a debtor. There is, of course, a narrower sense in which these terms are applicable only to those obligations which constitute debts, that is to say, obligations to pay a definite or liquidated sum of money. A technical synonym for obligation is chose in action or thing in action. A chosen action means, in our modern use of it, a proprietary right in personam, for example, a debt, a share in a joint stock company, money in the public funds, or a claim for damages for a tort. A non-proprietary right in personam, such as that which arises from a contract to marry, or from the contract of marriage, is no more a chose of action in English law than it is an obligatio in Roman law. Choses in action are opposed to choses in possession, though the latter term has all but fallen out of use. The true nature of the distinction thus expressed has been the subject of much discussion. At the present day, if any logical validity at all is to be ascribed to it, it must be identified with that between real and personal rights, that is to say, with the Roman distinction between dominium and obligatio. A chosen action is a proprietary right in personam. All other proprietary rights, including such objects of rights as are identified with the rights themselves, are chosen in possession. If we regard the matter historically, however, it becomes clear that this is not the original meaning of the distinction. In its origin, a chosen possession was anything or right which was accompanied by possession, while a chosen action was anything or right of which the claimant had no possession, but which he must obtain, if need be, by way of an action at law. Money in a man's purse was a thing in possession. Money due to him by a debtor was a thing in action. This distinction was largely, though not wholly, coincident with that between real and personal rights, for real rights are commonly possessed as well as owned, while personal rights are commonly owned but not possessed. This coincidence, however, was not complete. A chattel, for example, stolen from its owner, was reduced so far as he was concerned to a thing in action, but his right of ownership was not thereby reduced to a mere obligatio. The extraordinary importance attributed to the fact of possession was a characteristic feature of our early law, 
as this importance diminished the original significance of the distinction between things in possession and things in action was lost sight of and these terms gradually acquired a new meaning originally shares and annuities would probably have been classed as things in possession but they are now things in action conversely lands and chattels are now things in possession whether the owner retains possession of them or not obligations were always the most important species of things in action and they are now the only species neither the old law nor the new gives any countenance to the suggestion made by some that immaterial property such as patents copyrights and trademarks should be classed as choses in action section one hundred and sixty six solidary obligations the normal type of obligation is that in which there is one creditor and one debtor it often happens however that there are two or more creditors entitled to the same obligation or two or more debtors under the same liability the case of two or more creditors gives rise to little difficulty and requires no special consideration it is in most respects merely a particular instance of co-ownership the co-owners holding either jointly or in common according to circumstances the case of two or more debtors however is of some theoretical interest and calls for special notice examples of it are debts owing by a firm of partners debts owing by a principal debtor and guaranteed by one or more sureties and the liability of two or more persons who together commit a tort in all such cases each debtor is liable for the whole amount due the creditor is not obliged to divide his claim into as many different parts as there are debtors he may exact the whole sum from one and leave that one to recover from his co-debtors if possible and permissible a just proportion of the amount paid a debt of one hundred pounds owing by two partners a and b is not equivalent to one debt of fifty pounds owing by a and another of the same amount owing by b it is a single debt of one hundred pounds owing by each of them in such fashion that each of them may be compelled to pay the whole of it but that when it is once paid by either of them both are discharged from it obligations of this description may be called solidary since in the language of roman law each of the debtors is bound in solidum instead of pro parte that is to say for the whole and not for a proportionate part a solidary obligation therefore may be defined as one in which two or more debtors owe the same thing to the same creditor in english law they are of three distinct kinds being either one several two joint or three joint and several one solidary obligations are several when although the thing owed is the same in each case there are as many distinct obligations and causes of action as there are debtors each debtor is bound to the creditor by a distinct and independent vinculum juris the only connection between them being that in each case the subject matter of the obligation is the same so that performance by one of the debtors necessarily discharges all of the others also solidary obligations are joint on the other hand when though there are two or more debtors there is only one debt or other cause of action as well as only one thing owed the vinculum juris is single though it binds several debtors to the same creditor the chief effect of this unity of the obligation is that all the debtors are discharged by anything which discharges any one of them when the vinculum juris has once been severed as to any of them it is severed as to all where on the contrary solidary obligations are several and not joint performance by one debtor will release the others but in all other respects the different vincula juris are independent of each other three the third species of solidary obligations consist of those which are both joint and several as their name implies they stand halfway between the two extreme types which we have already considered they are the product of a compromise between two competing principles for some purposes the law treats them as joint and for other purposes as several for some purposes there is in the eye of the law only one single obligation and cause of action while for other purposes the law consents to recognize as many distinct obligations and causes of action as there are debtors on what principle then does the law determine the class of which any solidary obligation belongs speaking generally we may say that such obligations are several when although they have the same subject matter they have different sources they are several in their nature if they are distinct in their origin they are joint on the other hand when they have not merely the same subject matter but the same source joint and several obligations in the third place are those joint obligations which the law for special reasons chooses to treat in several respects as if they were several like those which are purely and simply joint they have the same source as well as the same subject matter but the law does not regard them consistently as comprising a single vinculum juris 
The following are examples of solidary obligations which are several in their nature. 1. The liability of a principal debtor, and that of his surety, provided that the contract of suretyship is subsequent to or otherwise independent of the creation of the debt so guaranteed. But if the two debts have the same origin, as where the principal debtor and the surety sign a joint bond, the case is one of joint obligation. 2. The liability of two or more co-sureties who guarantee the same debt independently of each other. They may make themselves joint, or joint in several debtors, on the other hand, by joining in a single contract of guarantee. 3. Separate judgments obtained in distinct actions against two or more persons liable for the same debt. Two persons, for example, jointly and severally liable on the same contract may be separately sued, and judgment may be obtained against each of them. In such a case they are no longer jointly liable at all. Each is now severally liable for the amount of his own judgment. But these two obligations are solidary, inasmuch as the satisfaction of one will discharge the other. 4. The liability of independent wrongdoers whose acts cause the same damage. This is a somewhat rare case, but it's perfectly possible. Two persons are not joint wrongdoers simply because they both act wrongfully and their acts unite to cause a single mischievous result. They must have committed a joint act. That is to say, they must have acted together with some common purpose. If not, they may be liable in solidum and severally for the common harm to which their separate acts contribute, but they are not liable as joint wrongdoers. In Thompson versus the London City Council, the plaintiff's house was injured by the subsidence of its foundations. The subsidence resulting from excavations negligently made by A, taken in conjunction with the negligence of B, a water company, in leaving a water main insufficiently stopped. It was held that A and B, inasmuch as their acts were quite independent of each other, were not joint wrongdoers and could not be joined in the same action. It was said by Lord Justice Collins, the damage is one, but the causes of action which have led to that damage are two, committed by two distinct personalities. The liability of the parties was solidary, but not joint. So also successive acts of wrongful conversion may be committed by two or more persons in respect to the same chattel. Each is liable in the action of Trover to the owner of the chattel for its full value, but they are liable severally and not jointly. The owner may sue each of them in different actions, though payment of the value by any one of them will discharge the other. Examples of joint obligations are the debts of partners and all other solidary obligations ex contractu, which have not been expressly made joint and several by the agreement of the parties. Examples of joint and several obligations are the liabilities of those who jointly commit a tort or breach of trust, and also all contractual obligations which are expressly made joint and several by the agreement of the parties. Section 167. The Sources of Obligations. Classed in respect of their sources or modes of origin, the obligations recognized by English law are divisible into the four following classes. 1. Contractual. Obligationis ex contractu. 2. Delictal. Obligationis ex delicto. 3. Quasi-contractual. Obligationis quasi ex contractu. 4. Innominate. Section 168. Obligations arising from contracts. The first and most important class of obligations consist of those which are created by contract. We have, in a former chapter, sufficiently considered the nature of a contract, and we there saw that it is a kind of agreement which creates rights in personam between the parties to it. Now, of rights in personam, obligations are the most numerous and important kind, and of those which are not obligations, comparatively few have their source in the agreement of the parties. The law of contract, therefore, is almost wholly comprised within the law of obligations, and for the practical purposes of legal classification, it may be placed there with sufficient accuracy. The coincidence, indeed, is not logically complete. A promise of marriage, for example, being a contract which falls within the law of status and not within that of obligations. Neglecting, however, this small class of personal contracts, the general theory of contract is simply a combination of the general theory of agreement with that of obligation and does not call for any further examination in this place. Section 169. Obligations arising from torts. The second class of obligations, consisting of those which may be termed delictal, or in the language of Roman law, obligationis ex delicto. By an obligation of this kind is meant the duty of making pecuniary satisfaction for that species of wrong which is known in English law as a tort. Etymologically, this term is merely the French equivalent of the English wrong, tort, tortum, being that which is twisted, crooked, or wrong, just as right, rectum, is that which is straight. 
as a technical term of english law however tort has become specialized in meaning and now includes merely one particular class of civil wrongs a tort may be defined as a civil wrong for which the remedy is an action for damages and which is not solely the breach of a contract or the breach of a trust or other merely equitable obligation this definition contains four essential elements there being four kinds of wrongs excluded by it from the sphere of tort one a tort is a civil wrong crimes are wrongs but not in themselves torts though there is nothing to prevent the same act from belonging to both these classes at once two even a civil wrong is not a tort unless the appropriate remedy for it is an action for damages there are several other forms of civil remedy besides this for example injunctions specific restitution of property and the payment of liquidated sums of money by way of penalty or otherwise any civil injury which gives rise exclusively to one of these other forms of remedy stands outside the class of torts the obstruction of a public highway for example is to be classed as a civil injury inasmuch as it may give rise to civil proceedings instituted by the attorney general for an injunction but although a civil injury it is not a tort save in those exceptional instances in which by reason of special damage suffered by an individual it gives rise to an action for damages at his suit three no civil wrong is a tort if it is exclusively the breach of a contract the law of contracts stands by itself as a separate department of our legal system over against the law of torts and to a large extent liability for breaches of contract and liability for torts are governed by different principles it may well happen however that the same act is both a tort and a breach of contract and this is so in at least two classes of cases a the first and simplest of these is that in which a man undertakes by contract the performance of a duty which lies on him already independently of any contract thus he who refuses to return a borrowed chattel commits both a breach of contract and also the tort known as conversion a breach of contract because he promised expressly or impliedly to return the chattel but not merely a breach of contract and therefore also a tort because he would have been equally liable for detaining another man's property even if he had made no such contract at all b the second class of cases is one which involves considerable difficulty and the law on this point cannot yet be said to have been thoroughly developed in certain instances the breach of a contract made with one person creates liability towards another person who is not a party to the contract it is a fundamental principle indeed that no person can sue on an obligatio ex contractu except a party to the contract nevertheless it sometimes happens that one person can sue ex delicto for the breach of a contract which was not made with him but from the breach of which he has suffered unlawful damage that is to say a man may take upon himself by contract with a a duty which does not already or otherwise rest upon him but which when it has once been undertaken he cannot break without doing such damage to b a third person as the law deems actionable thus if x lends his horse to y who delivers it to z a livery stable keeper to be looked after and fed and the horse is injured or killed by insufficient feeding presumably z is liable for this not only in contract to y but also in tort to x the owner of the horse it is true that apart from his contract with y z was under no obligation to feed the animal apart from the contract this was a mere omission to do an act which he was not bound to do yet having taken this duty upon himself he has thereby put himself in such a situation that he cannot break the duty without inflicting on the owner of the horse damage of a kind which the law deems wrongful the omission to feed the horse therefore although a breach of contract is not exclusively such and is therefore a tort inasmuch as it can be sued on by a person who was no party to the contract how far damage thus caused to one man by the breach of a duty undertaken by contract with another is actionable as a tort at the suit of the former is a question to be determined by the detailed rules of the concrete legal system and need not be here considered before the abolition of forms of action the relation between contract and tort was complicated and obscured by the existence of a class of fictitious torts wrongs which were in reality pure breaches of contract and nothing more and which nevertheless were remediable by delictal forms of action forms of action were classed as either contractual or delictal but contractual actions were illogically allowed in cases in which there was no true contract but only a quasi contract and delictal actions in cases where there was no true tort but a mere breach of contract there seems to be no longer any occasion for recognizing the existence of such quasi torts for they were merely a product of historical accident which may and should be now eliminated from the law they are a relic of the days when contractual remedies were so imperfectly developed 
that they had to be supplemented by the use of delictal remedies in cases of breach of contract. The contractual action of a sumset is, in its origin, merely a variant of the delictal action of case. It is not surprising, therefore, that until the abolition of all forms of action, our law failed to draw with accuracy the line between torts and breaches of contract. 4. The fourth and last class of wrongs, which are not torts, consists of breaches of trust or other equitable obligations. The original reason for their exclusion and separate classification is the historical fact that the law of trusts and equitable obligations originated and developed in the court of chancery and was wholly unknown to those courts of common law in which the law of torts grew up. But even now, although the distinction between law and equity is abolished, it is still necessary to treat breaches of trust as a form of wrong distinct from torts, and to deal with them along with the law of trust itself, just as breaches of contract are dealt with along with the law of contract. Torts, contracts, and trusts develop separately. The principles of liability in each case are largely different, and they must be retained as distinct departments of the law. By some writers, a tort has been defined as the violation of a right in rem, giving rise to an obligation to pay damages. There is a tempting simplicity and neatness in this application of the distinction between rights in rem and in personum, but it may be gravely doubted whether it does in truth conform to the actual contents of the English law of torts. Most torts undoubtedly are violations of rights in rem, because most rights in personum are created by contract. But there are rights in personum which are not contractual, and the violation of which, if it gives rise to an action for damages, must be classed as a tort. The refusal of an innkeeper to receive a guest is a tort, yet it is merely the breach of a non-contractual right in personum. So with any actionable refusal or neglect on the part of a public official to perform his statutory duties on behalf of the plaintiff. Section 170. Obligations arising from quasi-contracts. Both in Roman and in English law, there are certain obligations which are not, in truth, contractual, but which the law treats as if they were. They are contractual in law, but not in fact, being the subject matter of a fictitious extension of the sphere of contract to cover obligations which do not in reality fall within it. The Romans called them obligationes quasi ex contractu. English lawyers call them quasi-contracts, or implied contracts, or often enough contracts simply and without qualification. We are told, for example, that a judgment is a contract, and that a judgment debt is a contractual obligation. Implied contracts, says Blackstone, are such as reason and justice dictate, and which, therefore, the law presumes that every man undertakes to perform. Thus it is that every person is bound, and hath virtually agreed, to pay such particular sums of money as are charged on him by the sentence or assessed by the interpretation of the law. So the same author speaks, much too widely indeed, of the general implication and intendment of the courts of judicature that every man hath engaged to perform what his duty or justice requires. From a quasi-contract, or contract implied in law, we must carefully distinguish a contract implied in fact. The latter is a true contract, though its existence is only inferred from the conduct of the parties instead of being expressed. Thus, when I enter an omnibus, I impliedly, yet actually, agree to pay the usual fare. A contract implied in law, on the contrary, is merely fictitious, for the parties to it have not agreed at all, expressly or tacitly. In what cases, then, does the law recognize this fiction of quasi-contract? What classes of obligations are regarded as contractual in law, though they are not so in fact? To this question, it is not possible to give any complete answer here. We can, however, single out two classes of cases, which include most, though not all, of the quasi-contractual obligations known to the English law. 1. In the first place, we may say in general that in the theory of the common law, all debts are deemed to be contractual in origin. A debt is an obligation to pay a liquidated sum of money, as opposed to an obligation to pay an unliquidated amount, and as opposed also to all non-pecuniary obligations. Most debts are obligationis ex contractu, in truth and in fact, but there are many which have a different source. A judgment creates a debt which is non-contractual, so also does the receipt of money paid by mistake or obtained by fraud. Nevertheless, in the eye of the common law, they all fall within the sphere of contract, for the law conclusively presumes that every person who owes a debt has promised to pay it. Whatever, therefore, says Blackstone, the laws order anyone to pay, it becomes instantly a debt which he hath beforehand contracted to discharge. Hence it is that a judgment debtor, 
is in legal theory liable ex contractu to satisfy the judgment. The liability of the defendant, says Lord Escher, arises upon the implied contract to pay the amount of the judgment. Similarly, all pecuniary obligations of restitution are in theory contractual, as in the case of money paid by mistake or obtained by fraud or duress. If the defendant, says Lord Mansfield, be under an obligation from the ties of natural justice to refund, the law implies a debt and gives this action founded on the equity of the plaintiff's case, as it were, upon a contract, quasi ex contractu, as the Roman law expresses it. So also with pecuniary obligations of indemnity, when, for example, the goods of a stranger are distrained and sold by a landlord for rent due by his tenant, the law implies a promise by the tenant to repay their value to the owner thus deprived of them. A similar fictitious promise is the ground on which the law bases obligations of contribution. If, for example, two persons acting independently of each other guarantee the same debt, and one of them is subsequently compelled to pay the whole, he can recover half of the amount from the other as due to him under a contract implied in law, although there is clearly none in fact. 2. The second class of quasi contracts includes all those cases in which a person injured by a tort is allowed by the law to waive the tort and sue in contract instead. That is to say, there are certain obligations which are in truth delictal and not contractual, but which may at the option of the plaintiff be treated as contractual if he so pleases. Thus, if one wrongfully takes away my goods and sells them, he is guilty of the tort known as trespass, and his obligation to pay damages for the loss suffered by me is in reality delictal. Nevertheless, I may, if I think it to my interest, waive the tort and sue him on a fictitious contract, demanding from him the payment of the money so received by him as having rightly sold the goods as my agent, and therefore as being indebted to me in respect of the price received by him. And he will not be permitted to plead his own wrongdoing in bar of any such claim. So if a man obtains money from me by fraudulent misrepresentation, I may sue him either in tort for damages for the deceit, or on a fictitious contract for the return of the money. The reasons which have induced the law to recognize the fiction of quasi-contractual obligations are various. The chief of them, however, are the three following. 1. The traditional classification of the various forms of personal actions as being either based on contract or on tort. This classification could be rendered exhaustive and sufficient only by forcing all liquidated pecuniary obligations into the contractual class, regardless of their true nature and origin. The theory that all common law actions are either contractual or delictal is received by the legislature even at the present day, and its necessary corollary is the doctrine of quasi-contract. 2. The desire to supply a theoretical basis for new forms of obligation established by judicial decision. Here's elsewhere, legal fictions are of use in assisting the development of the law. It is easier for the courts to say that a man is bound to pay because he must be taken to have so promised than to lay down for the first time the principle that he is bound to pay whether he has promised or not. 3. The desire of plaintiffs to obtain the benefit of the superior efficiency of contractual remedies. In more than one respect, it was better in the old days of formalism to sue on contract than on any other ground. The contractual remedy of a sumsit was better than the action of debt, for it did not allow the defendant the resource of wager of law. It was better than trespass and other delectal remedies, for it did not die with the person of the wrongdoer, but was available against his executors. Therefore, plaintiffs were allowed to allege fictitious contracts and to sue on them in a sumsit, whereas in truth their appropriate remedy was debt or some action ex delicto. It seems clear that a rational system of law is free to get rid of the conception of quasi-contractual obligations altogether. No useful purpose is served by it in the present day. It still remains, however, part of the law of England and requires recognition accordingly. Section 171. Innominate Obligations. The foregoing classification of obligations as either contractual, delictal, or quasi-contractual is not exhaustive, for it is based on no logical scheme of division, but proceeds by simple enumeration only. Consequently, it is necessary to recognize a final and residuary class, which we may term innominate, as having no comprehensive and distinctive title. Included in this class are the obligations of trustees toward their beneficiaries, a species indeed, which would be sufficiently important and distinct to be classed separately as coordinate with the others which have been named, were it not for the fact that trusts are more appropriately treated in another branch of the law, namely that of property. Summary. Obligations defined. Choses in action. Solidary obligations. Their nature. 
their kinds, several, joint, joint and several, contractual obligations, delictal obligations, the nature of a tort, one, a civil wrong, two, actionable by way of damages, three, not a mere breach of contract, four, not a mere breach of trust or other equitable obligation. Quasi-contractual obligations, the nature of quasi-contract, instances of quasi-contracts, reasons for their recognition, innominate obligations. End of section 32. Section 33 of Jurisprudence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Jurisprudence by John Salmond. Chapter 22. The Law of Procedure. Part 1. Section 172. Substantive Law and the Law of Procedure. It is no easy task to state with precision the exact nature of the distinction between substantive law and the law of procedure, and it will conduce to clearness if we first consider a plausible but erroneous explanation. In view of the fact that the administration of justice, in its typical form, consists in the application of remedies to the violations of rights, it may be suggested that substantive law is that which defines the rights, while procedural law determines the remedies. This application, however, of the distinction between jus and remedium is inadmissible. For, in the first place, there are many rights which belong to the sphere of procedure. For example, a right of appeal, a right to give evidence on one's own behalf, a right to interrogate the other party, and so on. In the second place, rules defining the remedy may be as much a part of the substantive law as are those which define the right itself. No one would call the abolition of capital punishment, for instance, a change in the law of criminal procedure. The substantive part of the criminal law deals not with crimes alone, but with the punishments also. So in the civil law, the rules as to the measure of damages pertain to the substantive law, no less than those declaring what damage is actionable, and rules determining the classes of agreements which will be specifically enforced are as clearly substantive as are those determining the agreements which will be enforced at all. To define procedure as concerned not with rights, but with remedies, is to confound the remedy with the process by which it is made available. What, then, is the true nature of the distinction? The law of procedure may be defined as that branch of the law which governs the process of litigation. It is the law of actions, jus quod ad actionus pertinet using the term action in a wide sense to include all legal proceedings, civil or criminal. All the residue is substantive law, and relates not to the process of litigation, but to its purposes and subject matter. Substantive law is concerned with the ends which the administration of justice seeks. Procedural law deals with the means and instruments by which these ends are to be attained. The latter regulates the conduct and relations of courts and litigants in respect of the litigation itself, the former determines their conduct and relations in respect of the matters litigated. Procedural law is concerned with affairs inside the courts of justice. Substantive law deals with matters in the world outside. A glance at the actual contents of the law of procedure will enable us to judge of the accuracy of this explanation. Whether I have a right to recover certain property is a question of substantive law, for the determination and the protection of such rights are among the ends of the administration of justice. But in what courts and within what time I must institute proceedings are questions of procedural law, for they relate merely to the modes in which the courts fulfill their functions. What facts constitute a wrong is determined by the substantive law. What facts constitute proof of a wrong is a question of procedure. For the first relates to the subject matter of litigation, the second to the process merely. Whether an offense is punishable by fine or by imprisonment is a question of substantive law, for the existence and measure of criminal liability are matters pertaining to the end and purpose of the administration of justice. But whether an offense is punishable summarily or only on indictment is a question of procedure. Finally, it may be observed that, whereas the abolition of capital punishment would be an alteration of the substantive law, the abolition of imprisonment for debt was merely an alteration in the law of procedure. 
for punishment is one of the ends of the administration of justice, while imprisonment for debt was merely an instrument for enforcing payment. So far as the administration of justice is concerned with the application of remedies to violated rights, we may say that the substantive law defines the remedy and the right, while the law of procedure defines the modes and conditions of the application of the one to the other. Although the distinction between substantive law and procedure is sharply drawn in theory, there are many rules of procedure which in their practical operation are wholly or substantially equivalent to rules of substantive law. In such cases, the difference between these two branches of the law is one of form rather than of substance. A rule belonging to one department may by a change of form pass over into the other without materially affecting the practical issue. In legal history, such transitions are frequent, and in legal theory they are not without interest and importance. Of these equivalent procedural and substantive principles, there are at least three classes sufficiently important to call for notice here. Number one, an exclusive evidential fact is practically equivalent to a constituent element in the title of the right to be proved. The rule of evidence that a contract can be proved only by a writing corresponds to a rule of substantive law that a contract is void unless reduced to writing. In the former case, the writing is the exclusive evidence of title. In the latter case, it is part of the title itself. In the former case, the right exists, but is imperfect, failing in its remedy through defect of proof. In the latter case, it fails to come into existence at all. But for most purposes, this distinction is one of form rather than of substance. Number two, a conclusive evidential fact is equivalent to and tends to take the place of the fact proved by it. All conclusive presumptions pertain in form to procedure, but in effect to the substantive law. That a child under the age of seven years is incapable of criminal intention is a rule of evidence, but differs only in form from the substantive rule that no child under that age is punishable for a crime. That the acts of a servant done about his master's business are done with his master's authority is a conclusive presumption of law and pertains to procedure. But it is the forerunner and equivalent of our modern substantive law of employer's liability. A bond, that is to say an admission of indebtedness under seal, was originally operative as being conclusive proof of the evidence of the debt so acknowledged. But it is now itself creative of a debt, for it has passed from the domain of procedure into that of substantive law. Number three. The limitation of actions is the procedural equivalent of the prescription of rights. The former is the operation of time in severing the bond between right and remedy. The latter is the operation of time in destroying the right. The former leaves an imperfect right subsisting. The latter leaves no right at all. But save in this respect their practical effect is the same, although their form is different. The normal elements of judicial procedure are five in number, namely summons, pleading, proof, judgment, and execution. The object of the first is to secure for all parties interested an opportunity of presenting themselves before the court and making their case heard. Pleading formulates for the use of the court and of the parties those questions of fact or law which are in issue. Proof is the process by which the parties supply the court with the data necessary for the decision of these questions. Judgment is this decision itself while execution, the last step in the proceeding, is the use of physical force in the maintenance of the judgment, when voluntary submission is withheld. Of these five elements of judicial procedure, one only, namely proof, is of sufficient theoretical interest to repay such abstract considerations as is here in place. The residue of this chapter, therefore, will be devoted to an analysis of the essential nature of the law of evidence. Section 173. Evidence. One fact is evidence of another when it tends in any degree to render the existence of that other probable. The quality by virtue of which it has such an effect may be called its probative force, and evidence may therefore be defined as any fact which possesses such force. Probative force may be of any degree of intensity. When it is great enough to form a rational basis for the inference that the fact so evidenced really exists, the evidence possessing it is said to constitute proof. 
It is convenient to be able to distinguish shortly between the fact which is evidence and the fact of which it is evidence. The former may be termed the evidential fact, the latter the principal fact. Where, as is often the case, there is a chain of evidence, A being evidence of B, B of C, C of D, and so on, each intermediate fact is evidential in respect of all that follow it, and principal in respect of all that precede it. Number one. Evidences of various kinds, being in the first place either judicial or extrajudicial. Judicial evidence is that which is produced to the court. It comprises all evidential facts that are actually brought to the personal knowledge and observation of the tribunals. Extrajudicial evidence is that which does not come directly under judicial cognizance, but nevertheless constitutes an intermediate link between judicial evidence and the fact requiring proof. Judicial evidence includes all testimony given by witnesses in court, all documents produced to and read by the court, and all things personally examined by the court for the purposes of proof. Extrajudicial evidence includes all evidential facts which are known to the court only by way of inference from some form of judicial evidence. Testimony is extrajudicial, when it is judicially known only through the relation of a witness who heard it. A confession of guilt, for example, is judicial evidence if made to the court itself, but extrajudicial if made elsewhere and proved to the court by some form of judicial evidence. Similarly, a document is judicial evidence if produced, extrajudicial if known to the court only through a copy, or through the report of a witness who has read it. So the locus in quo, or the material subject matter of the suit, becomes judicial evidence when personally viewed by the court, but is extrajudicial when described by witnesses. It is plain that in every process of proof some form of judicial evidence is an essential element. Extrajudicial evidence may or may not exist. When it is presented, it forms an intermediate link or a series of intermediate links in a chain of proof, the terminal links of which are the principal fact at one end and the judicial evidence at the other. Judicial evidence requires production merely. Extrajudicial evidence stands itself in need of proof. Number two. In the second place, evidence is either personal or real. Personal evidence is otherwise termed testimony. It includes all kinds of statements regarded as possessed of probative force in respect of the facts stated. This is by far the most important form of evidence. There are few processes of proof that do not contain it, few facts that are capable of being proved in courts of justice otherwise than by the testimony of those who know them. Testimony is either oral or written, and either judicial or extrajudicial. There is a tendency to restrict the term to the judicial variety, but there is no good reason for this limitation. It is better to include under the head of testimony or personal evidence all statements, verbal or written, judicial or extrajudicial, so far as they are possessed of probative force. Real evidence, on the other hand, includes all the residue of evidential facts, anything which is believed for any other reason than that some one has said so is believed on real evidence. This too is either judicial or extrajudicial, though here there is also a tendency to restrict the term to the former use. Number three, Evidence is either primary or secondary. Other things being equal, the longer any chain of evidence, the less its probative force. For with each successive inference, the risk of error grows. In the interests of truth, therefore, it is expedient to shorten the process, to cut out as many as possible of the intermediate links of extrajudicial evidence, and to make evidence assume the judicial form at the earliest practicable point. Hence, the importance of the distinction between primary and secondary evidence. Primary evidence is evidence viewed in comparison with any available and less immediate instrument of proof. Secondary evidence is that which is compared with any available and more immediate instrument of proof. Primary evidence of the contents of a written document is the production in court of the document itself. Secondary evidence is the production of a copy or of oral testimony as to the contents of the original. Primary evidence that A assaulted B is the judicial testimony of C that he saw the assault. Secondary evidence is the judicial testimony of D 
that C told him that he saw the assault. That secondary evidence should not be used when primary evidence is available is, in its general form, a mere counsel of prudence. But in particular case, the most important of which are those just used as illustrations, this counsel has hardened into an obligatory rule of law. Subject to certain exceptions, the courts will receive no evidence of a written document save the document itself and will listen to no hearsay testimony. Number four, evidence is either direct or circumstantial. This is a distinction important in popular opinion rather than in legal theory. Direct evidence is testimony relating immediately to the principal fact. All other evidence is circumstantial. In the former case, the only inference required is one from testimony to the truth of it. In the latter, the inference is of a different nature and is generally not single but composed of successive steps. The testimony of A that he saw B commit the offense charged, or the confession of B that he is guilty, constitutes direct evidence. If we believe the truth of the testimony or confession, the matter is concluded, and no further process of proof or inference is required. On the other hand, the testimony of A that B was seen by him leaving the place where the offense was committed, and having the instrument of the offense in his possession, is merely circumstantial evidence. For, even if we believe this testimony, it does not follow without a further inference, and therefore a further risk of error, that B is guilty. Direct evidence is commonly considered to excel the other in probative force. This, however, is not necessarily the case, for witnesses lie, and facts do not. Circumstantial evidence of innocence may well prevail over direct evidence of guilt, and circumstantial evidence of guilt may be indefinitely stronger than direct evidence of innocence. Section 174, The Valuation of Evidence. The law of evidence comprises two parts. The first of these consists of rules for the measurement or determination of the probative force of evidence. The second consists of rules determining the modes and conditions of the production of evidence. The first deals with the effect of evidence when produced. The second with the manner in which it is to be produced. The first is concerned with evidence in all its forms, whether judicial or extrajudicial. The second is concerned with judicial evidence alone. The two departments are intimately connected, for it is impossible to formulate rules for the production of evidence without reference and relation to the effect of it when produced. Nevertheless, the two are distinct in theory, and for the most part distinguishable in practice. We shall deal with them in their order. In judicial proceedings, as elsewhere, the accurate measurement of the evidential value of facts is a condition of the discovery of truth. Except in the administration of justice, however, this task is left to common sense and personal discretion. Rules and maxims, when recognized at all, are recognized as proper for the guidance of individual judgment, not for the exclusion of it. But in this, as in every other part of judicial procedure, law has been generated and, in so far as it extends, has made the estimation of probative force or the weighing of evidence a matter of inflexible rules, excluding judicial discretion. These rules constitute the first and most characteristic portion of the law of evidence. They may be conveniently divided into five classes, declaring respectively that certain facts amount to 1. Conclusive proof, in other words, raise a conclusive presumption. 2. Presumptive proof, in other words, raise a conditional or rebuttable presumption. 3. Insufficient evidence, that is to say, do not amount to proof, and raise no presumption, conclusive or conditional. 4. Exclusive evidence, that is to say, are the only facts which, in respect of the matter in issue, possess any probative force at all. And 5. No evidence that is to say, are destitute of evidential value. Roman numeral 1. Conclusive presumptions. By conclusive proof is meant a fact possessing probative force of such strength as not to admit of effective contradiction. In other words, this fact amounts to proof irrespective of the existence or non-existence of any other facts whatsoever, which may possess probative force in the contrary direction. By a conclusive presumption is meant the acceptance or recognition of a fact by the law as conclusive proof. Presumptive or conditional proof, on the other hand, is a fact which amounts to proof, 
only so long as there exists no other fact amounting to disproof. It is a provisional proof, valid until overthrown by a contrary proof. A conditional or rebuttable presumption is the acceptance of a fact by the law as conditional proof. One of the most singular features of early systems of procedure is the extent to which the process of proof is dominated by conclusive presumptions. The chief part of the early law of evidence consists of rules determining the species of proof which is necessary and sufficient in different cases, and allotting the benefit or burden of such proof between the parties. He who would establish his case must maintain it, for example, by success in that judicial battle the issue of which was held to be the judgment of heaven. Judicium Dei. Or he must go unscathed through the ordeal, and so make manifest his truth or innocence. Or he must procure twelve men to swear in set form that they believe his testimony to be true. Or it may be sufficient if he himself makes solemn oath that his case is just. If he succeeds in performing the conditions so laid upon him, he will have judgment. If he fails even in the slightest point, he is defeated. His task is to satisfy the requirements of the law, not to convince the court of the truth of his case. What the court thinks of the matter is nothing to the point. The whole procedure seems designed to take away from the tribunals the responsibility of investigating the truth, and to cast this burden upon providence or fate. Only gradually and reluctantly did our law attain to the conclusion that there is no such royal road in the administration of justice, that the heavens are silent, that the battle goes to the strong, that oaths are not, and that there is no just substitute for the laborious investigation of the truth of things at the mouths of parties and witnesses. The days are long since past in which the conclusive presumptions played any great part in the administration of justice. They have not, however, altogether lost their early importance. They are, indeed, almost necessarily more or less false, for it is seldom possible in the subject matter of judicial procedure to lay down with truth a general principle that any one thing is conclusive proof of the existence of any other. Nevertheless, such principles may be just and useful even though not wholly true. We have already seen how they are often merely the procedural equivalents of substantive rules, which may have independent validity. They have also been of use in developing and modifying, by way of legal fictions, the narrow and perverted principles of the early law. As an illustration of their employment in modern law, we may cite the maxim, Reis judicata pro veritate excipitur. A judgment is conclusive evidence as between the parties, and sometimes as against all the world, of the matters adjudicated upon. The courts of justice may make mistakes, but no one will be heard to say so, for their function is to terminate disputes, and their decisions must be accepted as final and beyond question. Roman numeral 2. Conditional presumptions. The second class of rules for the determination of probative force are those which establish rebuttable presumptions. For example, a person shown not to have been heard of for seven years by those who would naturally have heard of him if he had been alive is presumed to be dead. So also, a negotiable instrument is presumed to have been given for value. So also, a person accused of any offense is presumed to be innocent. Many of these presumptions are based on no real estimate of probabilities, but are established for the purpose of placing the burden of proof upon the party who is best able to bear it, or who may most justly be made to bear it. Persons accused of crime are probably guilty, but the presumption of their innocence is in most cases, and with certain limitations, clearly expedient. Roman numeral 3. Insufficient evidence. In the third place, the law contains rules declaring that certain evidence is insufficient, that its probative force falls short of that required for proof, and that it is therefore not permissible for the courts to act upon it. An example is the rule that in certain kinds of treason, the testimony of one witness is insufficient, almost the sole recognition by English law of the general principle, familiar in legal history, that two witnesses are necessary for proof. Roman numeral 4. Exclusive evidence. In the fourth place, there is an important class of rules declaring certain facts to be exclusive evidence, none other being admissible. The execution of a document which requires attestation can be proved in no other way than by the testimony of an attesting witness, unless owing to death or some other circumstance, his testimony is unavailable. 
a written contract can be proved in no other way than by the production of the writing itself, whenever its production is possible. Certain kinds of contracts, such as one for the sale of land, cannot be proved except by writing, no verbal testimony being virtue enough in the law to establish the existence of them. It is only in respect of very special kinds of contracts that written evidence can wisely be demanded by the law. In the case of all ordinary mercantile agreements, such a requirement does more harm than good, and the law would do well in accepting the principle that a man's word is as good as his bond. The statute of frauds, by which most of these rules of exclusive evidence have been established, is an instrument for the encouragement of frauds rather than for the suppression of them. How much longer is it to remain in force as a potent instrument for the perversion of English law? Its repeal would sweep away at one stroke the immense accumulation of irrational technicality and complexity that has grown in the course of centuries from this evil root. Roman numeral five. Facts which are not evidence. Fifthly, and lastly, there are rules declaring that certain facts are not evidence, that is to say, are destitute of any probative force at all. Such facts are not to be produced to the court, and if produced, no weight is to be attributed to them, for no accumulation of them can amount to proof. For example, hearsay is no evidence. The bond of connection between it and the principal fact so reported at second hand being in the eye of the law too slight for any reliance to be justly placed upon it. Similarly, the general bad character of an accused person is no evidence that he is guilty of any particular offense charged against him, although his good character is evidence of his innocence. These rules of exclusion or relevancy assume two distinct forms, characteristic respectively of the earlier and later periods in the development of the law. At the present day, there are almost wholly rules for the exclusion of evidence. In earlier times, there were rules for the exclusion of witnesses. The law imposed testimonial incapacity upon certain classes of persons on the ground of their antecedent incredibility. No party to a suit, no person possessing any pecuniary interest in the event of it, no person convicted of any infamous offense, was a competent witness. His testimony was deemed destitute of evidential value on account of the suspicious nature of its source. The law has now learned that it is not in this fashion that the truth is to be sought for and found. It is now more confidence in individual judgment and less in general rules. It no longer condemns witnesses unheard, but receives the testimony of all, placing the old grounds of exclusion at their proper level as reasons for suspicion, but not for antecedent rejection. Whether rules for the exclusion of evidence are not in general exposed to the same objections that have already prevailed against the rules for the exclusion of witnesses is a question which we shall presently consider. End of section 33. Section 34 of Jurisprudence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Jurisprudence by John Salmond. Chapter 22. The Law of Procedure. Part 2. Section 175. The Production of Evidence. The second part of the Law of Evidence consists of rules regulating its production. It deals with the process of adducing evidence, and not with the effect of it when adduced. It comprises every rule relating to evidence, except those which amount to legal determinations of probative force. It is concerned, for example, with the manner in which witnesses are to be examined and cross-examined, not with the weight to be attributed to their testimony. In particular, it includes several important rules of exclusion based on grounds independent of any estimate of the probative force of the evidence so excluded. Considerations of expense, delay, vexation, and the public interest require much evidence to be excluded, which is of undoubted evidential value. A witness may be able to testify to much that is relevant and important in respect of the matters in issue, and nevertheless may not be compelled or even permitted to give such testimony. A public official, for example, cannot be compelled to give evidence as to affairs of state, nor is a legal adviser permitted or compellable to disclose communications made to him 
by or on behalf of his client. The most curious and interesting of all these rules of exclusion is the maxim Nemo tenetur se ipsum accusare. No man, not even the accused himself, can be compelled to answer any question the answer to which may tend to prove him guilty of a crime. No one can be used as the unwilling instrument of his own conviction. He may confess, if he so pleases, and his confession will be received against him, but, if tainted by any form of physical or moral compulsion, it will be rejected. The favor with which this rule has been received is probably due to the recoil of English law from the barbarities of the old continental system of torture and inquisitorial process. Even as contrasted with the modern continental procedure, in which the examination of the accused seems to English eyes too prominent and too hostile, the rule of English law is not without merits. It confers upon a criminal trial an aspect of dignity, humanity, and impartiality, which the contrasted inquisitorial process is too apt to lack. Nevertheless, it seems impossible to resist Bentham's conclusion that the rule is destitute of any rational foundation, and that the compulsory examination of the accused is an essential feature of sound criminal procedure. Even its defenders admit that the English rule is extremely favorable to the guilty, and, in a proceeding the aim of which is to convict the guilty, this would seem to be a sufficient condemnation. The innocent have nothing to fear from compulsory examination, and everything to gain. The guilty have nothing to gain, and everything to fear. A criminal trial is not to be adequately conceived as a fight between the accused and his accuser, and there is no place in it for maxims whose sole foundation is a supposed duty of generous dealing with adversaries. Subject always to the important qualifications that a good prima facie case must first be established by the prosecutor, every man should be compellable to answer with his own lips the charges that are made against him. A matter deserving notice in connection with this part of the law of evidence is the importance still attached to the ceremony of the oath. One of the great difficulties involved in the process of proof is that of distinguishing between true testimony and false. By what test is the lying witness to be detected, and by what means is corrupt testimony to be prevented? Three methods commended themselves to the wisdom of our ancestors. These were the judicial combat, the ordeal, and the oath. The first two of these have long since been abandoned as ineffective, but the third is still retained as a characteristic feature of judicial procedure, though we may assume with some confidence that its rejection will come in due time and will in no way injure the cause of truth and justice. Trial by battle, as soon as it acquired a theory at all, became in reality a form of ordeal. In common with the ordeal commonly so called, it is a judicium dei. It is an appeal to the god of battles to make manifest the right by giving the victory to him whose testimony is true. Successful might is the divinely appointed test of right. So in the ordeal, the party or witness whose testimony is impeached calls upon heaven to bear witness to his truth by saving him harmless from the fire. The theory of the oath is generically the same. An oath, says Hobbes, quote, is a form of speech added to a promise by which he that promiseth signifieth that unless he perform, he renounceth the mercy of his God, or calleth to him for vengeance on himself. Such was the heathen form, let Jupiter kill me also, as I kill this beast. So is our form, I shall do thus and thus, so help me God." Unquote. The definition is correct, save that it is restricted to promissory, instead of including also declaratory oaths. A man may swear not only that he will speak the truth, but that certain statements are the truth. The idea of the oath, therefore, is that his testimony is true, who is prepared to imprecate divine vengeance on his own head in case of falsehood. Yet, it needs but little experience of courts of justice to discover how ineffective is any such check on false witness, and how little likely is the retention of it to increase respect either for religion or for the administration of justice. The true preventative of false testimony is an efficient law for its punishment as a crime. 
punishment falling swiftly and certainly upon offending witnesses would purge the courts of an evil which the cumbrous inefficiency of the present law of perjury has done much to encourage and which all the oaths in the world will do nothing to abate section 176 criticism of the law of evidence we have in a former chapter considered the advantages and disadvantages of that substitution of predetermined principles for judicial discretion which constitutes the essential feature of the administration of justice according to law. In no portion of our legal system is this question of more immediate importance than in the law of evidence. Here, if anywhere, the demerits of law are at a maximum, and those of the opposing system at a minimum. General rules for the predetermination of probative force are of necessity more or less false. It is impossible to say with truth and a priori what evidence is or is not sufficient for proof. It is not true that hearsay is absolutely destitute of evidential value. It is not true that a contract for the sale of land cannot be satisfactorily proved by oral testimony. It is not true that the contents of a document cannot be well proved by a copy of it. To elevate these maxims, and such as these, from their proper position as counsels for warning and guidance, to the level of rigid and peremptory rules, is to be inevitably led astray by them. Like all general principles, they are obtained by way of abstraction and elimination of elements which may be, in particular instances, of the first importance. To apply such abstract principles to concrete cases without making the needful allowance for the special circumstances of these cases is as wise as to apply the laws of motion without allowing for the disturbing influence of friction. No unprejudiced observer can be blind to the excessive credit and importance attached in judicial procedure to the minutiae of the law of evidence. This is one of the last refuges of legal formalism. Nowhere is the contrast more striking between the law's confidence in itself and its distrust of the judicial intelligence. The fault is to be remedied not by the abolition of all rules for the measurement of evidential value, but by their reduction from the position of rigid and peremptory to that of the flexible and conditional rules. Most of them have their source in good sense and practical experience, and they are profitable for the guidance of individual discretion, though mischievous as substitutes for it. The cases are few in which we can rightly place such rules upon the higher level, in general, courts of justice should be allowed full liberty to reject as irrelevant, superfluous, or vexatious whatever evidence they will, and to accept at such valuation as they please whatever evidence seems good to them. We must learn to think less highly of the wisdom of the law, and less meanly of the understanding and honor of its administrators, and we may anticipate with confidence that in this department at least, of judicial practice, the change will be in the interests of truth and justice. Summary Law Substantive Relating to the subject matter of litigation Procedural Relating to the process of litigation The occasional equivalence of substantive and procedural rules Procedure Its elements Summons, pleading, proof, judgment, and execution the law of evidence. Evidence and proof defined. Kinds of evidence, namely, judicial and extrajudicial, personal and real, primary and secondary, direct and circumstantial. Divisions of the law of evidence. Roman numeral one. Rules determining probative force. Number one. Conclusive proof. Number two. Conditional proof. Number three, insufficient evidence. Number four, exclusive evidence. Number five, no evidence. Roman numeral two. Rules determining the production of evidence. Nemo tenetur se ipsum accusare. Oaths. Criticism of the law of evidence. End of section 34. Section 35 of Jurisprudence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Kibbe. Jurisprudence by John Salmond. Appendix 1. The Names of the Law. The purpose of the following pages is to consider, in respect of their origin and relations, the various names and titles which have been borne by the law in different languages. This seems an inquiry fit to be undertaken, in the hope that judicial terms may be found to throw some light upon the juridical ideas of which they are the manifestation. A comparison of diverse usages of speech may serve to correct misleading associations, or to suggest relations that may be easily overlooked by anyone confining his attention to a single language. The first fact which an examination of juridical nomenclature reveals is that all names for law are divisible into two classes, and that almost every language possesses one or more specimens of each. To the first class belong such terms as jus, duat, recht, dirito, equity. To the second belong lex, loi, gesetz, lege, law, and many others. It is a striking peculiarity of the English language that it does not possess any generic term falling within the first of these groups, for equity, in the technical juridical sense, means only a special department of civil law, not the whole of it, and therefore is not coextensive with jus, droit, and the other foreign terms with which it is classed. Since, therefore, we have in English no pair of contrasted terms adequate for the expression of the distinction between these two groups of names, we are constrained to have recourse to a foreign language, and we shall employ for this purpose the terms jus and lex, using each as typical of and representing all other terms which belong to the same group as itself. What, then, are the points of difference between jus and lex? What is the importance and the significance of the distinction between the two classes of terms? In the first place, jus has an ethical as well as a juridical application, while lex is purely juridical. Jus means not only law, but also right. Lex means law and not also right. Thus our own equity has clearly the double meaning. It means either the rules of natural justice, or that special department of the civil law which was developed and administered in the court of chancery. The English law, on the other hand, has a purely juridical application. Justice in itself, and as such, has no claim to the name of law. So also with doi, as opposed to loi, with recht as opposed to gesetz, with dorito as opposed to lege. If we inquire after the cause of this duplication of terms, we find it in the double aspect of the complete juridical conception of law. Law arises from the union of justice and force, of right and might. It is justice recognized and established by authority. It is right realized through power. Since, therefore, it has two sides and aspects, it may be looked at from two different points of view, and we may expect to find, as we find in fact, that it acquires two different names. Jus is law looked at from the point of view of right and justice. Lex is law looked at from the point of view of authority and force. Jus is the rule of right which becomes law by its authoritative establishment. Lex is the authority by virtue of which the rule of right becomes law. Law is jus in respect of its contents, namely the rule of right. It is lex in respect of its source, namely, its recognition and enforcement by the state. We see then how it is that so many words for law mean justice also. Since justice is the content or subject matter of law, and from this subject matter law derives its title. We understand also how it is that so many words for law do not also mean justice. Law has another side and aspect from which it appears, not as justice realized and established, but as the instrument through which its realization and establishment are effected. A priori we may presume that in the case of those terms which possess a double application, both ethical and legal, the ethical is historically prior and the legal later and derivative. We may assume that justice comes to mean law, not that law comes to mean justice. This is the logical order, and is presumably the historical order also. As a matter of fact, this presumption is, as we shall see, correct in the case of all modern terms possessing the double signification. In the case of rect, droit, diritto, equity, the ethical sense is undoubtedly primary, and the legal secondary. In respect to the corresponding Greek and Latin terms, jus dikaion, the data would seem insufficient for any confident conclusion. The reverse order of development is perfectly possible. There is no reason why lawful should not come to mean, in a secondary sense, rightful, 
though a transition in the opposite direction is more common and more natural. The significant fact is the union of the two meanings in the same word, not the order of development. A second distinction between jus and lex is that the former is usually abstract, the second concrete. The English term law indeed combines both these uses in itself. In its abstract application, we speak of the law of England, criminal law, courts of law. In its concrete sense, we say that Parliament has enacted or repealed a law. In foreign languages, on the other hand, this union of the two significations is unusual. Jus, droit, recht mean law in the abstract, not in the concrete. Lex, loi, gesetz signify, at least primarily and normally, a legal enactment or a rule established by way of enactment, not law in the abstract. This, however, is not invariably the case. Lex, loi, and some other terms belonging to the same group have undoubtedly acquired a secondary and abstract signification in addition to their primary and concrete one. In medieval usage, the law of the land is lex terra, and the law of England is lex et consuetudo angliae. So in modern French, loi is often merely an equivalent for droit. We cannot therefore regard the second distinction between jus and lex as essential. It is closely connected with the first, but though natural and normal, it is not invariable. The characteristic difference between English and foreign usage is not that our law combines the abstract and concrete significations, for so also do certain continental terms, but that the English language contains no generic term which combines ethical and legal meanings as du jus, droit, and rect. Rect, droit, derito. These three terms are all closely connected with each other and with the English right. The French and Italian words are derivatives of the Latin directus and rectus, these being cognate with rect and right. We may with some confidence assume the following order of development among the various ideas represented by this group of expressions. 1. The original meaning was in all probability physical straightness. This use is still retained in our right angle and direct. The root is rag, to stretch or straighten. The group of connected terms ruler, rex, raja, regulates, and others would seem to be independently derived from the same root, but not to be in the same line of development as right and its synonyms. The ruler, or regulator, is he who keeps things straight or keeps order, not he who establishes the right. Nor is the right that which is established by a ruler. 2. In a second and derivative sense, the terms are used metaphorically to indicate moral approval, ethical rightness, not physical. Moral disapproval is similarly expressed by the metaphorical expressions wrong and tort, that is to say, crooked or twisted. These are metaphors that still commend themselves, for the honest man is still the straight and upright man, and the ways of wickedness are still crooked. In this sense, therefore, rect, droit, and derito signify justice and right. 3. The first application being physical and the second ethical, the third is juridical. The transition from the second to the third is easy. Law is justice as recognized and protected by the state. The rules of law are the rules of right, as authoritatively established and enforced by tribunals appointed to that end. What more natural, therefore, than for the ethical terms to acquire derivatively a juridical application? At this point, however, our modern English right has parted company with its continental relatives. It has remained physical and ethical, being excluded from the juridical sphere by the superior convenience of the English law. 4. The fourth and last use of the terms we are considering may be regarded as derivative of both the second and third. It is that in which we speak of rights, namely, claims, powers, or other advantages conferred or recognized by the rule of right or the rule of law. That a debtor should pay his debt to his creditor is not merely right, it is the right of the creditor. Right is his right for whose benefit it exists. So also, wrong is the wrong of him who is injured by it. The Germans distinguish this use of the term by the expression subjectives rect, right is vested in a subject, as opposed to objectives rect, namely, the rule of justice or of law as it exists subjectively. The English right has been extended to cover legal as well as ethical claims, though it has, as we have seen, been confined to ethical rules. A. S. Reit. It is worthy of notice that the Anglo-Saxon reit, the progenitor of our modern right, possessed like its continental relatives the legal in addition to the ethical meaning. The common law is folk reit. The divine law is Godes reit. A plaintiff claims property as his by folk reit, even as a Roman would have claimed it as being dominus ex jur curitium. 
The usage, however, did not prosper. It had to face the formidable and ultimately successful rivalry of the English, originally Danish, law, and even Norman French, on its introduction into England, fell under the same influence. For a time, indeed, in the earlier books, we find both Dois and Lay as competing synonyms, but the issue was never doubtful. The archaism of common right, as a synonym for common law, is the sole relic left in England of a usage universal in continental languages. Equity The English term equity has pursued the same course of development as the German Recht and the French Dois. 1. Its primitive meaning. If we trace the word back to its Latin source, equum, is physical equality or evenness, just as physical straightness is the earliest meaning of right and its analogues. 2. Its secondary sense is ethical. Just as rightness is straightness, so equity is equality. In each case there is an easy and obvious metaphorical transition from the physical to the moral idea. Equity, therefore, is justice. 3. In a third and later stage of its development, the word takes on a juridical significance. It comes to mean a particular portion of the civil law, that part, namely, which was developed by and administered in the court of chancery. Like Recht and Dois, it passed from the sense of justice in itself to that of the rules in accordance with which justice is administered. 4. Fourthly and lastly, we have to notice a legal and technical use of the term equity, as meaning any claim or advantage recognized or conferred by a rule of equity, just as a right signifies any claim or advantage derived from a rule of right. An equity is an equitable as opposed to a legal right. When the equities are equal, so runs the maxim of chancery, the law prevails. So a debt is assignable, subject to equities. Jus We have to distinguish in the case of jus the same three uses that have already been noticed in the case of rect, droit, and equity. 1. Right or justice. Id quod semper aquam ac bonum eius dicitur, says Paulus. From jus in this sense are derived justilia and justum. 2. Law. This is the most usual application of the term, the juridical sense having a much greater predominance over the ethical in the case of jus, than in that of its modern representatives, rect and droit. Jus, in its ethical signification, is distinguished as jus natural, and in its legal sense as jus civil. It is often contrasted with phas, the one being human and the other divine law. Jus, however, is also used in a wider sense to include both of these. Jus divinum et humanum. 3. A right, moral or legal. Jusum sique tribuer. The origin and primary signification of jus are uncertain. It is generally agreed, however, that the old derivation from jusum and juber is not merely incorrect, but an actual reversal of the true order of terms and ideas. Jusum is a derivative of jus. Juber is, in its proper and original sense, to declare, hold, or establish anything as jus. It was the recognized expression for the legislative action of the Roman people. Le gem juber is to give to a statute, lex, the force of law, jus. Only in a secondary and derivative sense is juber equivalent to imperare. The most probable opinion is that jus is derived from the Aryan root u, to join together, a root which appears also in jugum, jungo, and in the English yoke. It has been suggested accordingly that jus in its original sense means that which is fitting, applicable, or suitable. If this is so, there is a striking correspondence between the history of the Latin term and that of the modern words already considered by us, the primary sense in all cases being physical, the ethical sense being a metaphorical derivative of this, and the legal application coming last. The transition from the physical to the ethical sense, in the case of the English fit and fitting, is instructive in this connection. Another suggestion, however, is that jus means primarily that which is binding, the bond of moral and subsequently of legal obligation. But no definite conclusion on this matter is possible. Vici do vicaion. The Greek term which most nearly corresponds to the Latin jus is vici. These words cannot, however, be regarded as synonymous. The juridical use of jus is much more direct and predominant than the corresponding use of viki. Indeed, we may say of the Greek term that it possesses juridical implications rather than applications. Its chief uses are the following, the connection between them being obvious. 1. Custom, usage, way. 2. Right, justice. 
3. Law, or at least legal right. 4. Judgment. 5. A lawsuit. 6. A penalty. 7. A court of law. The primary sense is said to be that first mentioned, viz. custom. The transition is easy from the idea of the customary to that of the right, and from the idea of the right to that of the lawful. In the case of the Latin mos, we may trace an imperfect and tentative development in the same direction. Professor Clark, on the other hand, prefers to regard judgment as the earliest meaning of viki, the other ethical and legal applications being derivatives from this, and of viki in the sense of custom being an independent formation from the original root. Such an order of development seems difficult and unnatural. Analogy and the connection of ideas seem to render more probable the order previously suggested, viz. custom, right, law, and finally the remaining legal uses. Thamus Thamus Days as Vicky corresponds to Jus, so Thamus apparently corresponds to Vaz. While Vaz, however, preserved its original signification as that which is right by divine ordinance, and never acquired any secondary legal applications or implications, the Greek term proved more flexible, and consequently has to be reckoned with in the present connection. The matter is one of very considerable difficulty, and no certain conclusions seem possible, but the following order of development would seem to commend itself as the most probable. 1. Thamus, divine ordinance, the will of the gods. The term is derived from the Aryan root da, to set, place, appoint, or establish, which appears also in thesmos, a statue or ordinance. The latter term, however, included human enactments, while thamus was never so used. The Greek term is cognate with thesis and theme, and with our English doom, a word whose early legal uses we shall consider later. 2. Thamus, right. The transition is easy, from that which is decreed and willed by the gods, to that which it is right for mortal men to do. 3. Themistes, the rules of right, whether moral or legal, so far as any such distinction was recognized in that early stage of thought to which these linguistic usages belong. 4. Themistes, judgments, judicial declarations of the rules of right and law. Lex. So far, we have dealt solely with those words which belong to the class of jus, namely, those which possess a double signification, ethical and legal. We proceed now to the consideration of the second class, represented by lex, and first of lex itself. The following are its various uses, given in what is probably the historical order of their establishment. 1. Proposals, terms, conditions, offers made by one party and accepted by another. Thus, a lege ut, on condition that, dicta tbs lex, you know the conditions, his legibus, on these conditions, so legis passis are the terms and conditions of peace, pax data philippo and has leges est. Similarly in law, legis locationis are the terms and conditions agreed upon between lender and borrower. So we have the legal expressions lex mensipii, lex commissoria, and others. 2. A statute enacted by the populus romanus, in the Comitia Centuriata, on the proposal of a magistrate. This would seem to be a specialized application of lex in the first mentioned sense. Such a statute is conceived rather as an agreement than as a command. It is a proposal made by the consuls and accepted by the Roman people. It is therefore lex, even as a proposal of peace made and accepted between the victor and the vanquished is lex. Lex, says Justinian, est quod populus Romanus senatorio magistratu interrogante, voluti consul, constitubat. 3. Any statute howsoever made, whether by way of authoritative imposition or by way of agreement with the self-governing people. 4. Any rule of action imposed or observed, e.g. lex locundi, lex sermonis. This is simply an analogical extension similar to that which is familiar in respect to the corresponding terms in modern languages, law, loi, gesetz. 5. Law in the abstract sense. Lex so used cannot be regarded as classical Latin, although in certain instances, as in Cicero's references to lex natura, we find what seems a very close approximation to it. In medieval Latin, however, the abstract signification is quite common, as in the phrases lex romana, lex terra, lex communis, lex et constituto. Lex has become equivalent to jus in its legal applications. This use is still retained in certain technical expressions of private international law, such as lex fori, lex domicilii, and others. It is possible that we have here an explanation of the very curious fact that so celebrated and important a word as jus failed to maintain itself in the Romance languages. 
Of the two terms, jus and lex, bequeathed to later times by the Latin language, one was accepted, loa equals lex, and the other rejected and supplanted by a modern substitute, dua dorito. Why was this? May it not have been owing to that post-classical use of lex in the abstract sense, whereby it became synonymous and coextensive with jus? If lex romana was jus civile, why should the growing languages of modern Europe cumber themselves with both terms? The survivor of the two rivals was lex. At a later stage, the natural evolution of thought and speech conferred juridical uses on the ethical terms duat and dorito, and the ancient duality of legal nomenclature was restored. 6. Judgment. This, like the last and like the three following uses, is a medieval addition to the meanings of lex. We have already seen the transition from law to judgment in the case of jus, vici, and themis. Le gem facer is to obey or fulfill the requirements of a judgment. Le gem vadier, the English wager of law, is to give security for such obedience and fulfillment. 7. The penalty, proof, or other matter imposed or required by a judgment. Lex ignia, the ordeal of fire. Lex duelli, trial by battle. 8. Legal rights, regarded collectively as constituting a man's legal standing or status. Le gem emeter, in English, to lose one's law, was an early English law, an event analogous to the capitus diminuto and infamia of the Romans. It was a loss of legal status, a partial deprivation of legal rights and capacities. Nomos. As Vicky corresponds to jus, and Themis to phas, so nomos is the Greek equivalent of lex. We have to distinguish two uses of the term, one earlier in general, the other later in specialized. 1. Nomos is used in a very wide sense to include any human institution, anything established or received among men, whether by way of custom, opinion, convention, law, or otherwise. It was contrasted, at least in the language of the philosophers, with physis, or nature. That which is natural is though physicon. That which is artificial, owing its origin to the art and invention of mankind, is thonomicon. It is often said that the earliest meaning of nomos is custom. The original conception, however, seems to include not merely that which is established by long usage, but that which is established, received, ordained, or appointed in whatever fashion. Nomos is institutum rather than constituto. Nomos, in a later secondary and specialized application, means a statute, ordinance or law. So prominent among human institutions are the laws by which men are governed, so greatly with increasing political development do the spheres and influence of legislation extend themselves, that the nomos became in a special and preeminent sense the laws of the state. Nomos was a word unknown to Homer, but it became in later times the leading juridical term of the Greek language. The Greeks spoke and wrote of the laws, nomi, while the Romans, perhaps with a truer legal insight, concerned themselves with the law, jus. When, like Cicero, they write de legibus, it is an imitation of Greek usage. Law Law is by no means the earliest legal term acquired by the English language. Curiously enough, indeed, it would seem not even to be indigenous, but to be one of those additions to Anglo-Saxon speech which are due to the Danish invasions and settlements. Of the earlier terms, the commonest, and the most significant for our present purpose, is dumb, the ancestor of our modern doom. A dumb or doom is either one, a law, ordinance, or statute, or two, a judgment. It does not seem possible to attribute with any confidence historical priority to either of these senses. In modern English, the idea of judgment has completely prevailed over and excluded that of ordinance, but we find no such predominance of either meaning in Anglo-Saxon usage. The word has its source in the Aryan root da, to place, set, establish, appoint, and it is therefore equally applicable to the decree of the judge and to that of the lawgiver. In the laws of King Alfred we find the term in both its senses. These are the dooms which Almighty God himself spake unto Moses and commanded him to keep. Judge then not one doom to the rich and another to the poor. In the following passage of the laws of Edgar, the laws of the Danes are plainly equivalent to the dooms of the English. I will that secular right stand among the Danes with as good laws as they best may choose. But with the English, let that stand which I and my witten have added to the dooms of my forefathers. Doom is plainly cognate to Themis. The religious implication, however, which, in the Greek term, is general and essential, is, in the English term, special and accidental. In modern English, doom is, like Themis, the will, decree, and judgment of heaven, fate or destiny. 
but the Anglo-Saxondom included the ordinances and judgments of mortal men, no less than those of the gods. Thamus, therefore, acquired the sense of human law only derivatively through the sense of right, and so belongs to the class of jus, not of lex. While doom, like Themistes, acquired juridical applications directly, and so stands besides lex and nomos. Dum, together with all the other Anglo-Saxon legal terms, including, strangely enough, right itself, was rapidly superseded by lagu, which is the modern law. The new term makes its appearance in the 10th century, and the passage cited above from the laws of King Edgar is one of the earliest instances of its use. Lagu and law are derived from the root lag, to lay, settle, or place. Law is that which is laid down. There is a considerable conflict of opinion as to whether it is identical in origin with the Latin lex, lege. Schmidt and others decide in the affirmative, and the probabilities of the case seem to favor this opinion. The resemblance between law and lex seems too close to be accidental. If this is so, the origin of lex is to be found in the Latin lego, not in its later sense of reading, but in its original sense of laying down or setting, as in the derivative lectus, which is also the primary signification of the Greek yego, the German legen, and the English lay. If this is so, then law and lex are alike that which is laid down, just as gesetz is that which is set, setzen. This interpretation is quite consistent with the original possession by lex of a wider meaning than statute, as already explained. We still speak of laying down terms, conditions, and propositions, no less than of laying down commands, rules, and laws. Lex, however, is otherwise and variously derived from, or connected with, ligere, to bind, legere, to read, and yeging, to say or speak. It is true, indeed, that by several good authorities it is held that the original meaning of lagu and law is that which lies, not that which has been later settled, that which is customary, not that which is established by authority. The root lag, however, must contain both the transitive and intransitive senses, and I do not know what evidence there is for the exclusion of the former from the signification of the derivative law. Moreover, there seems no ground for attributing to lagu the meaning of custom. It seems from the first to have meant the product of authority, not that of use and want. It is statutum, not constituto. As soon as we meet with it, it is equivalent to dumb. The analogy also of lex, gesetz, dumb, thamus, and other similar terms is in favor of the interpretation here preferred. End of section 35 Section 36 of Jurisprudence This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jurisprudence by John Salmon Appendix 2. The Theory of Sovereignty in discussing the theory of the state, we noticed the distinction between sovereign and subordinate power. The former is that which, within its own sphere, is absolute and uncontrolled, while the latter is that which is subject to the control of some power superior and external to itself. We have now to consider, in relation to this distinction, a celebrated doctrine which we may term Hobbes's theory of sovereignty. It was not, indeed, originated by the English philosopher, but is due rather to the celebrated French publicist Boudin, from whom it first received definite recognition as a central element of political doctrine. In the writings of Hobbes, however, it assumes greater prominence and receives more vigorous and clear-cut expression, and it is to his advocacy and to that of his modern followers that its reception in England must be chiefly attributed. The theory in question may be reduced to three fundamental propositions. 1. That sovereign power is essential in every state. 2. That sovereign power is indivisible. 3. That sovereign power is unlimited and illimitable. The first of these propositions must be accepted as correct, but the second and third would seem to have no solid foundation. The matter, however, is one of very considerable obscurity and complexity, and demands careful consideration. 1. Sovereignty Essential It seems clear that every political society involves the presence of supreme power. For otherwise, all power would be subordinate, and this supposition involves the absurdity of a series of superiors and inferiors ad infinitum. Yet, although this is so, 
there is nothing to prevent the sovereignty which is thus essential from being wholly or partly external to the state it is indeed only in the case of those states which are both independent and fully sovereign that the sovereignty is wholly internal no part of it being held or exercised ab extra by any other authority when a state is dependent that is to say merely a separately organized portion of a larger body politic the sovereign power is vested wholly or in part in the larger unity and not in the dependency itself similarly when a state though independent is only semi-sovereign its autonomy is impaired through the possession and exercise of a partial sovereignty by a superior state in all cases therefore sovereign power is necessarily present somewhere but it is not in all cases to be found in its entirety within the borders of the state itself. 2. Indivisible Sovereignty Every state, it is said, necessarily involves not merely sovereignty, but a sovereign, that is to say, one person or one body of persons in whom the totality of sovereign power is vested. Such power, it is said, cannot be shared between two or more persons it is not denied that the single supreme body may be composite as the english parliament is but it is alleged that whenever there are in this way two or more bodies of persons in whom sovereign power is vested they necessarily possess it as joint tenants of the whole and cannot possess it as tenants in severalty of different parts the whole sovereignty may be in a or the whole of it in b or the whole of it in a and b jointly but it is impossible that part of it should be in A, and the residue in B. We may test this doctrine by applying it to the British Constitution. We shall find that this Constitution in no way conforms to the principles of Hobbes on this point, but it is on the contrary a clear instance of divided sovereignty. The legislative sovereignty resides in the Crown and the two Houses of Parliament, but the executive sovereignty resides in the crown by itself, the Houses of Parliament having no share in it. It will be understood that we are here dealing exclusively with the law or legal theory of the Constitution. The practice is doubtless different, for in practice the House of Commons has obtained complete control over the executive government. In practice the ministers are the servants of the legislature and responsible to it, in law they are the servants of the crown through whom the crown exercises that sovereign executive power which is vested in it by law independently of the legislature altogether in law then the executive power of the crown is sovereign being absolute and uncontrolled within its own sphere this sphere is not indeed unlimited there are many things which the crown cannot do it cannot pass laws or impose taxes. But what it can do, it does with sovereign power. By no other authority in the state can its powers be limited, or the exercise of them controlled, or the operation of them annulled. It may be objected by the advocates of the theory in question that the executive is under the control of the legislature, and that the sum total of sovereign power is therefore vested in the latter, and is not divided between it and the executive. The reply is that the crown is not merely itself a part of the legislature, but a part without whose consent the legislature cannot exercise any fragment of its own power. No law passed by the two houses of parliament is operative unless the crown consents to it. How, then, can the legislature control the executive? Can a man be subject to himself? A power over a person, which cannot be exercised without that person's consent, is no power over him at all. A person is subordinate to a body of which he is himself a member, only if that body has power to act notwithstanding his dissent. A dissenting minority, for example, may be subordinate to the whole assembly. But this is not the position of the crown." the english constitution therefore recognizes a sovereign executive no less than a sovereign legislature each is supreme within its own sphere and the two authorities are kept from conflict by the fact that the executive is one member of the composite legislature 
the supreme legislative power is possessed jointly by the crown and the two houses of parliament but the supreme executive power is held in severalty by the crown when there is no parliament that is to say in the interval between the dissolution of one parliament and the election of another the supreme legislative power is non-existent but the supreme executive power is retained unimpaired by the crown this is not all however for until the passing of the parliament act nineteen eleven the british constitution recognized a supreme judicature as well as a supreme legislature and executive the house of lords in its judicial capacity as a court of final appeal was sovereign its judgments were subject to no further appeal and its acts were subject to no control what it declared for law no other authority known to the constitution could dispute without its own consent its judicial powers could not be impaired or controlled nor could their operation be annulled the consent of this sovereign judicature was no less essential to legislation than was the consent of the sovereign executive the house of lords therefore held in severalty the supreme judicial power while it shared the supreme legislative power with the crown and the house of commons three illimitable sovereignty sovereign power is declared by the theory in question to be not merely essential and indivisible but also illimitable not only is it uncontrolled within its own province but that province is infinite in extent Quote, it appeareth plainly to my understanding says hobbes both from reason and scripture that the sovereign power whether placed in one man as in monarchy or in one assembly of men as in popular and aristocratical commonwealths is as great as possibly men can be imagined to make it and whosoever thinking sovereign power too great will seek to make it less must subject himself to the power that can limit it that is to say to a greater End quote. so austin quote, it follows from the essential difference of a positive law and from the nature of sovereignty and independent political society that the power of a monarch properly so called or the power of a sovereign number in its collegiate and sovereign capacity is incapable of legal limitation supreme power limited by positive law is a flat contradiction in terms end quote. this argument confounds the limitation of power with the subordination of it that sovereignty cannot within its own sphere be subject to any control is self-evident for it follows from the very definition of this species of power but that this sphere is necessarily universal is a totally different proposition and one which cannot be supported it does not follow that if a man is free from the constraint of any one stronger than himself his physical power is therefore infinite in considering this matter we must distinguish between power in fact and power in law for here as elsewhere that which is true in law may not be true in fact and vice versa a de facto limitation of sovereign power may not be also a de jure limitation of it and conversely the legal theory of the constitution may recognize limitations which are non-existent in fact that sovereign power may be and indeed necessarily is limited de facto is sufficiently clear great as is the power of the government of a modern and civilized state there are many things which it not merely ought not to do but cannot do they are in the strictest sense of the term beyond its de facto competence for the power of a sovereign depends on and is measured by two things first the physical force which he has in his command and which is the essential instrument of his government and second the disposition of the members of the body politic to submit to the exercise of this force against themselves neither of these two things is unlimited in extent therefore the de facto sovereignty which is based upon them is not unlimited either this is clearly recognized by bentham in this mode of limitation he says quote, i see not what there is that needs surprise us by what is it that any degree of power meaning political power is established 
it is neither more nor less than the habit of and a disposition to obedience this disposition it is as easy or i am much mistaken to conceive as being absent with regard to one sort of acts as present with regard to another for a body then which is in other respects supreme to be conceived as being with respect to a certain sort of acts limited all that is necessary is that this sort of acts be in its description distinguishable from every other these bounds the supreme body in question has marked out to its authority of such a demarcation then what is the effect either none at all or this that the disposition to obedience confines itself within these bounds beyond them the disposition is stopped from extending beyond them the subject is no more prepared to obey the governing body of his own state than that of any other what difficulty i say should there be in conceiving a state of things to subsist in which the supreme authority is thus limited what greater difficulty in conceiving it with this limitation than without any i cannot see the two states are i must confess to me alike conceivable whether alike expedient alike conducive to the happiness of the people is another question End quote. the follower of hobbes may admit the de facto but deny the de jure limitation of sovereign power he may contend that even if there are many things which the sovereign has no power to do in fact there is and can be nothing whatever which he has no power to do in law the law he may say can recognize no limitations in that sovereign power from which the law itself proceeds in reply to this it is to be observed that the law is merely the theory of things as received and operative within courts of justice it is the reflection and image of the outer world seen and accepted as authentic by the tribunals of the state this being so whatever is possible in fact is possible in law and more also whatsoever limitations of sovereign power may exist in fact may be reflected in and recognized by the law to allow that the de facto limitations are possible is to allow the possibility of corresponding limitations de jure if the courts of justice habitually act upon the principle that certain functions or forms of activity do not according to the constitution pertain to any organ in the body politic and therefore lie outside the scope of sovereign power as recognized by the constitution then that principle is by virtue of its judicial application a true principle of law and sovereign power is limited in law no less than in fact the contrary view is based on that unduly narrow view of the nature of law which identifies it with the command of the sovereign issued to his subjects in this view law and legal obligation are coextensive and the legal limitation of supreme power appears to involve the subjection of the possessor of it to legal obligations in respect to the exercise of it this of course conflicts with the very definition of sovereign power and is clearly impossible that sovereign power may be legally controlled within its own province is a self-contradictory proposition that its province may have legally appointed bounds is a distinct and valid principle there is one application of the doctrine of illimitable sovereignty which is of sufficient importance and interest to deserve special notice among the chief functions of sovereign power is legislation it follows from the theory in question that in every political society there necessarily exists some single authority possessed of unlimited legislative power this power is indeed alleged to be the infallible test of sovereignty in seeking for that sovereign who according to the doctrine of hobbes is to be found somewhere in every body politic all that is necessary is to discover the person who possesses the power of making and repealing all laws without exception he and he alone is the sovereign of the state for he necessarily has power over all and in all and is subject to none as to this it is to be observed that the extent of legislative power depends on and is measured by 
the recognition accorded to it by the tribunals of the state. Any enactment which the law courts decline to recognize and apply is by that very fact not law, and lies beyond the legal competence of the body whose enactment it is. And this is so, whether the enactment proceeds from a borough council or from the supreme legislature. As the law of England actually stands, there are no legal limitations on the legislative power of the imperial parliament. No statute passed by it can be rejected as ultra rires by any court of law. This legal rule of legislative omnipotence may be wise or it may not, but it is difficult to see by what process of reasoning the jurist can demonstrate that it is theoretically necessary. At no very remote period it was considered to be the law of England that a statute made by Parliament was void if contrary to reason and the law of God. The rule has now been abandoned by the courts, but it seems sufficiently obvious that its recognition involves no theoretical absurdity or impossibility, however inexpedient it may be. Yet it clearly involves the limitation of the power of the legislature by a rule of law. To take another example, the most striking illustration of the legislative omnipotence of the English Parliament is its admitted power of extending the term for which an existing House of Commons has been elected. Delegates appointed by the people for a fixed time have the legal power of extending the period of their own delegated authority. It is difficult to see any theoretical objection to a rule of the opposite import. Why should not the courts of law recognize and apply the principle that an existing parliament is sovereign only during the limited time for which it was originally appointed, and is destitute of any power of extending that time? And in such a case, would not the authority of the supreme legislature be limited by a rule of law? The exercise of legislative power is admittedly subject to legal conditions why not then to legal limitations if the law can regulate the manner of the exercise of legislative power why not also its matter as the law stands parliament may repeal a statute in the same session and in the same manner in which it was passed what then would be the effect of a statute providing that no statute should be repealed save by an absolute majority in both houses would it not create good law, and so prevent either itself or any other statute from being repealed, save in manner so provided? What if it is provided further, that no statute shall be repealed until after ten years from the date of its enactment? Is such a statutory provision void? And if valid, will it not be applied by the law courts, so that any attempt to repeal either it or any other statute less than ten years old, will be disregarded as beyond the competence of parliament and if a statute can be made unrepealable for ten years how is it legally impossible that it should be made unrepealable for ever such a rule may be very unwise but by what argument are we to prove that it involves a logical absurdity in respect of its legislative omnipotence the english parliament is almost unique in modern times most modern constitutions impose more or less stringent limitations upon the powers of the legislature. In the United States of America, neither Congress nor any state legislature possesses unrestricted powers. They cannot alter the constitutions by which they have been established, and those constitutions expressly withdraw certain matters from their jurisdiction. Where, then, is the sovereignty vested? The reply made is that these constitutions contain provisions for their alteration by some other authority than the ordinary legislature, and that the missing legislative power is therefore to be found in that body to which the right of altering the constitution has been thus entrusted. In the United States, the sovereignty, it is said, is vested not in Congress, but in a majority of three-fourths of the state legislatures. This composite body has absolute power to alter the Constitution, and is therefore unbound by any of the provisions of it, and is so possessed of unlimited legislative power. 
Now, whenever the Constitution has thus entrusted absolute powers of amendment to some authority other than the ordinary legislature, this is a perfectly valid reply. But what shall we say of a Constitution which, while it prohibits alteration by the ordinary legislature, provides no other method of effecting constitutional amendments? There is no logical impossibility in such a Constitution, yet it would be clearly unalterable in law. That it would be amended in defiance of the law cannot be doubted, for a constitution which will not bend will sooner or later break. But all questions as to civil and supreme power are questions as to what is possible within, not without, the limitations of the constitution. If there is no constitution which meets with true observance, there is no body politic, and the theory of political government is deprived of any subject matter to which it can apply. The necessary datum of all problems relating to sovereignty is the existence and observance of a definite scheme of organized structure and operation, and it is with this datum and presupposition that we must discuss the question of the extent of legislative power. Even where a constitution is not wholly it may be partly unchangeable in law. Certain portions of it may on their original establishment be declared permanent and fundamental, beyond the reach even of the authority to which in other respects the amendment of the Constitution is entrusted. Article 5 of the Constitution of the United States of America provides that no state shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate without its own consent. Having regard to this provision, what body is there in the United States which has vested in it unlimited legislative power? The same article provides that certain portions of the Constitution shall be unalterable until the year 1808. What became of sovereign power in the meantime? End of section 36「Section thirty seven of Jurisprudence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Overby, who does not speak Latin. Jurisprudence by John Salmond. Appendix three. The Maxims of the Law. Legal maxims are the proverbs of the law. They have the same merits and defects as other proverbs, being brief and pithy statements of partial truths. They express general principles without the necessary qualifications and exceptions, and they are therefore much too absolute to be taken as trustworthy guides to the law. Yet they are not without their uses. False and misleading when literally read, these established formulae provide useful means for the expression of leading doctrines of the law in a form which is at the same time brief and intelligible. They constitute a species of legal shorthand, useful to the lawyer, but dangerous to anyone else, for they can be read only in the light of expert knowledge of that law, of which they are the elliptical expression. The language of legal maxims is almost invariably Latin, for they are commonly derived from the civil law, either literally or by adaptation, and most of those which are not to be found in the Roman sources, are the invention of medieval jurists. The following is a list of the more familiar and important of them, together with brief comments and references. 1. Actus non facit reum nisi mens sit rea. Leges Henrici primi. The act alone does not make the doer of it guilty, unless it is done with a guilty mind. Material without formal wrongdoing, is not a ground of liability. The presence either of wrongful intent or of culpable negligence is a necessary condition of responsibility. See sections 127, 132, and 145. 2. Adversus extraneous, videosa possessio prondes solet. Prior possession is a good title of ownership against all who cannot show a better. In the civil law, however, from which this maxim is derived, it has a more special application, and relates to the conditions of possessory remedies. See section 161. 3. Apices juris 
non sunt jura. Legal principles must not be carried to their most extreme consequences, regardless of equity and good sense. A principle valid within certain limits becomes false when applied beyond these limits. The law must avoid the falsehood of extremes. See section 10. 4. Cessante ratione legis cessat lex ipsa. In the application of this maxim, we must distinguish between common and statute law. 1. Common law. A legal principle must be read in the light of the reason for which it was established. It must not be carried further than the reason warrants. And if the ratio legis wholly fails, the law will fail also. 2. Statute law. To statute law, the maxim has only a limited application, for such law depends upon the authority of the litera legis. It is only when the letter of the law is imperfect that recourse may be had to the reason of it, as a guide to its due interpretation. The maxim in question, therefore, is valid only as a rule of restricted interpretation. The complementary rule of extensive interpretation is ubi idem ratio ibi idem ius. 5. Cogitationis poenum nemo patitur. The thoughts and intents of men are not punishable. The law takes notice only of the overt and external act. In exceptional cases, however, the opposite maxim is acceptable. Voltunus reputator pro facto. The law takes the will for the deed. See section 137. 6. Communis error facit you. A precedent, even though erroneous, will make valid law if its authority has been so widely accepted and relied on that its reversal has become inexpedient in the interests of justice. See section 65. 7. Cuis est solum aius est usque ad silum. See section 155. 8. De minimis non curat lex. The law takes no account of trifles. This is a maxim which relates to the ideal rather than to the actual law. The tendency to attribute undue importance to mere matters of form, the failure to distinguish adequately between the material and the immaterial, is a characteristic defect of legal systems. See section 10. 9. Ex nudo pacto non oritor actio. In English law, this maxim expresses the necessity of a legal consideration for the validity of a contract. Nudum pactum is pactum sin causa promittendi. In the civil law, however, the maxim means, on the contrary, that an agreement, to become binding, must fall within one of the recognized classes of legally valid contracts. There was no general principle that an agreement, as such, had the force of law. See section 124. 10. Ex turpi causa non oritor actio. An agreement contrary to law or morals can give rise to no right of action in any party to it, either for the enforcement of it or for the recovery of property parted with in pursuance of it. Confer the maxim, in pari delicto podior est conditio defendentis. See section 124. 11. Ignorantia facti excusat, ignorantia iuris non excusat. See section 146, 147. 12. Impossibilium nulla obligatio est. Otherwise, lex non cogit ad impossibilia. Impossibility is an excuse for the non-performance of an obligation, a rule of limited application. 13. In jure non remota causa set proxima spectator. A man is not liable for all the consequences of his acts, but only for those which are natural and probable, that is to say, those which he foresaw or ought to have foreseen. 14. In pari causa podior est conditio possidentis. Possession and ownership, fact and right, enjoyment and title, are presumed by the law to be coincident. Every man may therefore keep what he has got, until and unless someone else can prove that he himself has a better title to it. See section 107. 15. In pari delicto podior est conditio defendentis. Identical in effect with the maxim ex turpi causa non oritor actio. 16. Inter arma leges silent. This maxim has a double application. 1. As between the state and its external enemies, the laws are absolutely silent. No alien enemy has any claim to the protection of the laws 
or of the courts of justice. He is destitute of any legal standing before the law, and the government may do as it pleases with him and his. 2. Even as regards to the rights of subjects and citizens, the law may be put to silence by necessity in times of civil disturbance. Necessitas non habet legem. Extrajudicial force may lawfully supersede the ordinary process and course of law whenever it is needed for the protection of the state and the public order against illegal violence. See section 36. 17. Invito beneficium non datur. The law confers upon a man no rights or benefits which he does not desire. Whoever waives, abandons, or disclaims a right will lose it. See section 122. 18. Juris precepta sunt his, honiste vivere alterum non laidere sum sic tribure. These are the precepts of the law, to live honestly, to hurt no one, and to give every man his own. Attempts have been sometimes made to exhibit these three precepta juris as based on a logical division between the sphere of legal obligation into three parts. This, however, is not the case. They are simply different modes of expressing the same thing, and each of them is wide enough to cover the whole field of legal duty. The third of them, indeed, is simply a variant of the received definition of justice itself. Justitia est constans et perpetua voluntas jus sum sic tribuendi. 19. Jus publicum privatorum pactis mutari non potest. By jus publicum, it means that portion of the law in which the public interests are concerned, and which, therefore, is of absolute authority and not liable to be superseded by conventional law made by the agreement of private persons. Confer the maxim modus et conventio vincunt legem. See section 124. 20. Modus et conventio vincunt legem. The common law may in great measure be excluded by conventional law. Agreement is a source of law between the parties to it. See sections 11 and 122. 21. Necessitas non habet legem. Confer Bacon's maxims of the law. 5. Necessitas inducit privilegium, a recognition of the u necessitatis. See section 139. 22. Neminem oportet legibus esse sapientiorum. It is not permitted to be wiser than the laws. In the words of Hobbes, see Leviathan chapter 29, the law is the public conscience, and every citizen owes to it an undivided allegiance not to be limited by any private views of justice or expediency. See section 9. 23. Nemo plus juris ad alium transfere potest quam ipse haberet. The title of an assignee can be no better than that of his assignor. Confer the maxim nemo dat qui non habet. See section 163. 24. Nemo tenetur se ipsum accusare. The law compels no man to be his own accuser or to give any testimony against himself, a principle now limited to the criminal law. See section 175. 25. Nemo dat qui non habet. No man can give a better title than that which he himself has. See section 163. 26. Non omne quod licet honestum est. All things that are lawful are not honorable. The law is constrained by the necessary imperfections of its methods to confer many rights and allow many liberties, which a just and honorable man will not claim or exercise. 27. Nullus videtur dolo facere qui suo ju iur utitur. A malicious or improper motive cannot make wrongful in law an act which would be rightful apart from such motive. The rule, however, is subject to important limitations. See section 136. 28. Qui facit per alium facit per se. He who does a thing by the instrumentality of another is considered as if he had acted in his own person. 29. Qui prior est tempore, porior est jure. Where two rights or titles conflict, the earlier prevails, unless there is some special reason for preferring the latter. See section 85. 30. Quad fieri non debet factum valet. A thing which ought not to have been done 
may nevertheless be perfectly valid when it is done. The penalty of nullity is not invariably imposed upon illegal acts. For example, a marriage may be irregularly celebrated and yet valid, and a precedent may be contrary to established law and yet authoritative for the future. See section 66. 31. Res judicata pro veritate accipitor. A judicial decision is conclusive evidence, inter partes, of the matter decided. See section 67. 32. Respondeat superior. Every master must answer for the defaults of his servant as for his own. See section 149. 33. Sic utere tuo ut alienum non laidas. Every man must so use his own property as to not harm that of another. This is the necessary qualification of the maxim that every man may do as he will with his own. See section 154. 34. Sumum you summa injuria. The rigor of the law, untempered by equity, is not justice, but the denial of it. See sections 10 and 13. 35. Superficies solo sedit. Whatever is attached to the land forms part of it. Confer omne quod inaidificator solo sedit. See section 155. 36. Ubi iedem ratio ibi idem u. This is the complement of the maxim cessante rationi legis, cessat lex ipsa. A rule of the common law should be extended to all cases in which the same ratio applies, and, in the case of imperfect statute law, extensive interpretation based on the ratio legis is permissible. 37. Ubi u ibi remedium. Whenever there is a right, there should also be an action for its enforcement. That is to say, the substantive law should determine the scope of the law of procedure, and not vice versa. Legal procedure should be sufficiently elastic and comprehensive to afford the requisite means for the protection of all rights, which the substantive law sees fit to recognize. In early systems, this is far from being the case. We there find remedies and forms of actions determining rights, rather than rights determining remedies. The maxim of primitive law is rather, ubi remedium ibi u. 38. Vigilantibus non dormientibus jura subveniunt. The law is provided for those who wake, not for those who slumber and sleep. He who neglects his rights will lose them. It is on this principle that the law of prescription is founded. See section 162. 39. Volenti non fit injuria. No man who consents to a thing will be suffered thereafter to complain of it as an injury. He cannot waive his right and then complain of its infringement. End of section 37. Section 38 of Jurisprudence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jurisprudence by John Salmond. Appendix 4. The Divisions of the Law. English law possesses no received and authentic scheme of orderly arrangement. Exponents of this system have commonly shown themselves too little careful of appropriate division and classification, and too tolerant of chaos. Yet we must guard ourselves against the opposite extreme, for theoretical jurists have sometimes fallen into the contrary error of attaching undue importance to the element of form. They have esteemed too highly both the possibility and the utility of ordering the world of law in accordance with the strictest principles of logical development. It has been said by a philosopher concerning human institutions in general, and therefore concerning the law and its arrangement, that they exist for the uses of mankind, and not in order that the angels in heaven may delight themselves with the view of their perfections. In the classification of legal principles, the requirements of practical convenience must prevail over those of abstract theory. The claims of logic must give way in great measure to those of established nomenclature and familiar usage and the accidents of historical development 
must often be suffered to withstand the rules of scientific order among the various points of view of which most branches of the law admit there are few if any which may be wisely adopted throughout their whole extent and among the various alternative principles of classification expedience allows of no rigidly exclusive and consistent choice there are few distinctions however important in their leading applications which may not rightly as they fade towards the boundary line be replaced by others which there possess a deeper significance we may rest content therefore if within the limits imposed by the needful conformity to received speech and usage each portion of the law is dealt with in such of its aspects as best reveals its most important characters and relations and in such order as is most convenient with lucid and concise exposition one the introductory portion of the law the first portion of the corpus juris is of an introductory nature consisting of all those rules which by virtue of their preliminary character or of the generality of their application cannot be appropriately relegated to any special department this introduction may be divided into four parts the first of them is concerned with the sources of law it comprises all those rules in accordance with which new law obtains recognition and the older law is modified or abrogated it is here for example that we must look for the legal doctrine as to the operation of precedent custom and legislation the second part of the introduction deals with the interpretation of law here we shall find the rules in accordance with which the language of the law is to be construed and also the definition of those terms which are fitly dealt with here because common to several departments of the law in the third place the introduction comprises the principles of private international law the principles that is to say which determine the occasional exclusion of english law from english courts of justice and the recognition and enforcement therein of some foreign system which possess for some reason a better claim to govern the case in hand fourthly and lastly it is necessary to treat as introductory a number of miscellaneous rules which are of so general an application as not to be appropriately dealt with in any special department of the legal system two private and public law after the introduction comes the body of private law as opposed to that of public law by general consent this roman distinction between jus privatum and jus publicum is accepted as the most fundamental division of the corpus juris public law comprises the rules which specially relate to the structure powers rights and activities of the state private law includes all the residue of legal principles it comprises all those rules which specially concern the subjects of the state in their relations to each other together with those rules which are common to the state and its subjects in many of its actions and relations the state stands on the same level as its subjects and submits itself to the ordinary principles of private law it owns land and chattels makes contracts employs agents and servants and enters into various forms of commercial undertaking and in respect to all these matters it differs little in its juridical position from its own subjects public law therefore is not the whole of the law that is applicable to the state and to its relations with its subjects but only those parts of it which are different from the private law concerning the subjects of the state and their relations to each other for this reason private law precedes public in the order of exposition the latter presupposes a knowledge of the former the two divisions of public law are constitutional and administrative law it is impossible however to draw any rigid line between these two for they differ merely in the degree of importance pertaining to their subject matters constitutional law deals with the structure powers and functions of the supreme power in the state together with those of all the more important of the subordinate departments of government administrative law on the other hand is concerned with the multitudinous forms and instruments in and through which the lower ranges of governmental activity manifest themselves 
3. Civil and Criminal Law Within the domain of private law, the division which calls for primary recognition is that between civil and criminal law. Civil law is that which is concerned with the enforcement of rights, while criminal law is concerned with the punishment of wrongs. We have examined and rejected the opinion that crimes are essentially offenses against the state or the community at large, while civil wrongs are committed against private persons. According to the acceptance or rejection of this opinion, criminal law pertains either to public or to private law. Our classification of it as private is unaffected by the fact that certain crimes, such as treason and sedition, are offenses against the state. As already explained, logical consistency in the division of the law is attainable only if we are prepared to disregard the requirements of practical convenience. Greater weight is wisely attributed to the fact that treason and robbery are both crimes than to the fact that the one is an offense against the state and the other an offense against an individual. Just as the law which is common to both state and subject is considered under the head of private law alone, so the law which is common to crimes and to civil injuries is dealt with under the head of civil law alone. It is obvious that there is a great body of legal principles common to the two departments. The law as to theft involves the whole law as to the acquisition of property and chattels, and the law of bigamy involves a considerable portion of the law of marriage. The arrangement sanctioned by usage and convenience is, therefore, to expound first the civil law in its entirety, and thereafter, under the title of criminal law, such portions of the law of crime as are not already comprehended in the former department. 4. Substantive Law and the Law of Procedure Civil and criminal law are each divisible into two branches, namely, substantive law and the law of procedure, a distinction the nature of which has already been sufficiently considered. 5. Divisions of the Substantive Civil Law The substantive civil law may be conveniently divided, by reference to the nature of the rights with which it is concerned, into three great branches, namely, the law of property, the law of obligations, and the law of status. The first deals with proprietary rights in rem, the second with proprietary rights in personam, and the third with personal as opposed to proprietary rights. 6. The Law of Property Although the distinction between the law of property and that of obligations is a fundamental one, which might be recognized in any orderly scheme of classification, there is a great part of the substantive civil law which is common to both of these branches of it. Thus the law of inheritance or succession concerns all kinds of proprietary rights, whether in rem or in personam. So also with the law of trusts and that of securities. In general, the most convenient method of dealing with these common elements is to consider them once for all in the law of property, thus confining the law of obligations to those rules which are peculiar to obligations, just as the elements common to civil and criminal law are dealt with in the civil law, and those common to private and public law in private law. The law of property is divisible into the following chief branches. 1. The law of corporeal property, namely, the ownership of land and chattels. 2. The law of immaterial objects of property, such as patents, trademarks, and copyrights. 3. The law of encumbrances, or jura in re aliena, such as tendencies, servitudes, trusts, and securities. 4. The law of testamentary and intestate succession. 7. The law of obligations. The law of obligations comprises the law of contracts, the law of torts, and the law of those miscellaneous obligations which are neither contractual nor delictal. It may be convenient to consider under the same head the law of insolvency, inasmuch as the essential significance of insolvency is to be found in its operation as a method of discharging debts and liabilities. Alternatively, however, 
this branch of law may be included in the law of property, inasmuch as it deals with one mode of divesting property rights in general. In the law of obligations is also to be classed the law of companies, this being essentially a development of the law of the contract of partnership. Under the head of companies are to be comprised all forms of contractual incorporation, all other bodies corporate pertaining either to public law or to special departments of private law with which they are exclusively concerned. The general doctrine as to the corporations is to be found in the introductory department of the law. 8. The Law of Status The law of status is divisible into two branches dealing respectively with domestic and extra-domestic status. The first of these is the law of family relations, and deals with the nature, acquisition, and loss of all those personal rights, duties, liabilities, and disabilities which are involved in domestic relationship. It falls into three divisions, concerned respectively with marriage, parentage, and guardianship. The second branch of the law of status is concerned with all the personal rights, duties, liabilities, and disabilities which are external to the law of the family. It deals, for example, with the personal status of minors, in relation to others than their parents, of married women, in relation to others than their husbands and children, of lunatics, aliens, convicts, and any other classes of persons whose personal condition is sufficiently characteristic to call for separate consideration. There is one class of personal rights which ought in logical strictness to be dealt with in the law of status, but is commonly and more conveniently considered elsewhere. Those rights, namely, which are called natural, because they belong to all men from their birth, instead of being subsequently acquired. For example, the rights of life, liberty, reputation, and freedom from bodily harm. These are personal rights and not proprietary. They constitute part of a man's status, not part of his estate. Yet we seldom find them set forth in the law of status. The reason is that such rights, being natural and not acquired, call for no consideration except in respect to their violation. They are adequately dealt with, therefore, under the head of civil and criminal wrongs. The exposition of the law of libel, for example, which is contained in the law of torts, involves already the proposition that a man has a right to his reputation, and there is no occasion, therefore, for a bald statement to that effect in the later law of status. Summary. The Divisions of the Law. 1. Introduction. A. Sources of the Law. B. Interpretation and Definitions. C. Private International Law. D. Miscellaneous Introductory Principles. 2. Private Law. The two divisions, Civil Law, Criminal Law. Under Criminal Law, Substantive, Procedure. Under Substantive, General Part, Special Part. Under Civil Law, Substantive and Procedure. Under Procedure, Practice, Evidence. Under Substantive, Property, Obligations, Status. Under Property, 1. Corporeal Property, which divides into land and chattels. 2. Immaterial Property, which divides into patents, trademarks, etc. 3. Encumbrances, which divides into leases, servitudes, trusts, securities, etc. 4. Succession, which divides into testamentary and intestate. Under Obligations. 1. Contracts, which divides into general part and special part. 2. Torts, which divides into general part and special part. 3. Miscellaneous Obligations. 4. Insolvency. 5. Companies. Under Status. 1. Domestic Status and Extra Domestic Status. Domestic Status, which divides into Marriage, Parentage, Guardianship. Extra Domestic Status, which divides into Infants, Married Women, Lunatics, Aliens, Convicts, etc. 3. Public Law. 
which divides into constitutional law, administrative law. End of section 38. End of Jurisprudence by John Salmond.